uh, 13th of September 2018 and welcome to the Planning Committee. Um, late items to be, oh, so it's a apologies, have we any apologies? Councillor McChrystal is stuck in traffic but on his way. Are there any others? No? Okay. Uh, late items to be introduced by the Chair. If anybody's here for the cock and bull story, um, the application at uh, uh, Stenson Road, uh, that's been withdrawn as there are new plans come in and uh, that will go to next month's committee. Um, a happy announcement, we now have an enforcement officer, so everybody better look out. It's Mark Johnson, um, he's starting on the 24th of September, perhaps we should keep that confidential, uh, but he's got previous uh, experience with uh, Derby City Council, um, and uh, more than happy to come back, which is, is, is a good thing. Uh, the only other thing is, uh, you'll all be aware and have read cover to cover the new um, NPPF uh, that the government has issued. Um, we're going to have a, a five, ten minute break, um, brief on that at the end, uh, if, if people would like that from, from Stephen Teasdale. I think uh, it's worth reading, but it's certainly, um, we need to know the relevant differences. If anything comes up that's relevant to that during the meeting, obviously uh, Stephen will advise us. After that, uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of July, if you can remember that long ago. Are they accepted as a true record? <laughs> Thank you. And of the Conservation Area Advisory Committee held on the 5th of July. Thank you. Appeal decisions, we have um, three. In. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, the first one, uh, site of 192 London Road, Alverston. Uh, it's located between the former Roundhouse and the Alverston Methodist Church on the south side of London Road. And we refused uh, planning permission uh, on design and amenity grounds for the erection of a, a standalone apartment block, three storey, for nine apartments. And we'd had some pre application engagement with the agent and felt that it wasn't of the right design quality for the area and the inspector wrote a fairly lengthy uh, letter and it's quite a good read actually and it supports our policies CP3, CP4 in the uh, Derby City local plan and the safe policies um, in the City of Derby local plan review. So it was a good all-round victory and um, sort of indicated our position at the pre-application stage th through the life of the application. Secondly, 11 Chevin Road, you'll remember this one. Uh, it came with a positive recommendation, but members um, didn't like the design solution and the inspector. He, he, al he allowed the appeal, um, but he didn't really write a very lengthy report, not, not like the, um, the offering that was at London Road. So um, that's just one where probably worth taking a look at it, but not, not, a, not a great lengthy uh, discussion about the merits of the case. Uh, and, the, and the final one, it's one um, at Pizza Express on Iron Gate. It was the shop front was one of the, I think it was the first first scheme in the conservation area that uh, won the George Rennie Award. And uh, list of building consent was sought for um, strips of uh, LED light strips around the, the shop front, and we didn't think it was really compatible um, with the list of building or the conservation area. But the inspector disagreed so that may be one chair for uh, conservation advisory to note as well but a um, bit disappointing that one but we'll uh, we'll just take that one on the chin thank you you'll recall the the chevin road one um the officers recommended it be granted but we unanimously all four political parties and that doesn't happen very often re, re, uh, re, uh, refused it so um so much for localism uh, an inspector who isn't from Derby has decided it can go ahead, whereas all the elected representatives from Derby said no. But uh, we learn the lesson, don't we, on these things? <coughs> oh, we should, yes. Okay, that brings us on then to the applications. Um, oh, we've got the development control um, performance, which, as usual, says that Derby is a damn sight better than the government asks us to be. If you look at those statistics on page two, um, 
the government says we should do 60% within 13 weeks, and we did 100%. And I think that's a pat on the back for all the officers concerned. Um, that's major and non-major, uh, they say 70% in eight weeks, and we did 87%, so that's pretty good going. Do you have any further comment on that, Ian? Uh, no, just the, it is a team effort, of course, and the, I was at a meeting yesterday where Peak National Park had been falling into to trouble as regards the quality assessment with appeals, which is raised in um, 4.11, uh, and we are nowhere near uh, that category, so we, we, we're doing all right uh, on all counts. I mean, there are areas of the service we can continually improve and we're always looking at doing that but the the figures are very pleasing so thank you for the uh, the the praise and the commentary thank you, thank you. Um, let's bring us on then to item eight which is applications to be considered uh, there are a number of members of the public here um, and obviously we don't want you to sit through the entire evening waiting for yours to come up so i wonder if i could take by a show of hands those who are here for the most popular as it were um, i have had a request uh, that we look at St Peter Street early because Councillor Hussain wants to speak on that and he has to go off to another committee pretty quickly. So I'm going to take that one first. Um, but can I see anybody here for the Baker Street? Um, okay. And the uh, Derby Road, Chelliston? Okay. Uh, and Cock and Bulls out. West Park Community School? Okay, Blenheim Drive, okay, and uh, Ruffina Farm, okay. Right, so um, we'll take that as a running order with St. Peter Street first, which is on page 50, um, and Stephen Bate is going to introduce that to us. Thank you, Chairman. This is an application for proposed change of use from Class A1 retail to a mixed use of Classes A3 and A5, which are restaurant and hot food takeaway. The only external works which are proposed as part of the application are for an extraction flue, which is at the rear of the premises. Um, the details of the changes to the shop front and any advertising are not included in this application. The site is located within the city centre on the main pedestrianised street. Um, there are a mixture of uses in the surrounding area and the premises were previously occupied by the computer shop Game, although it is currently occupied by a temporary, uh, temporary shop selling artworks. The applicant has submitted supporting information uh, which is included in the report and that includes letters from the St Peter's Quarter BID, from Marketing Derby and from FHP surveyors. Uh, these comments are all summarised in the report, but they consider that the changes in retail trading mean that policy designations are outdated and that the proposal would have a positive impact on the shopping centre. Um, and at this point, I'd also mention some comments which have been brought to me late uh, by our Director of Development and Regrowth, who uh, has seen an article in the Derby Telegraph, and he says... Um, he questions whether we are opposed to this application. He says that he doesn't see this as an unacceptable damage to the retail integrity, feels it's quite the opposite. City centre retail is in many respects a leisure activity and the provision of different types of food offers among retail strengthens, not weakens the retail offer. So those are the comments of our director. Uh, we have received three representations to the application. These are primarily concerned at the loss of amenity through odour and through the loss of character. Uh, and there's one objection on the grounds of competition, which, uh, as members will be aware, is not a material planning consideration. Councillor Rawson has referred this application to committee to allow members to discuss the merits of protecting retail frontages. Uh, there are no technical objections to the proposal uh, from any statutory consultees. Uh, and I'd also say that members should be aware that although a specific operator is being proposed uh, for the, uh, the use, um, any permission that's granted would be able to be opened by any food operator. So in terms of the considerations of the application, these primarily re relate to whether it, uh, the change of use complies with planning policy or whether there are other overriding justifications. 
The premises are located within the city centre, uh, within the central business district, St Peter's Quarter and Beckettwell Regeneration Area. And under core strategy policy AC3, the site is located within the primary shopping frontage. It's acknowledged that the St Peter's Quarter reflects a more traditional high street, but it should remain predominantly retail in function. The, this proposal would lead to another loss of a Class A1 retail use, and a recent survey has shown that there are only 30% of units in this stretch of St Peter Street currently operating as Class A1 retail premises. So there is a very strong policy objection to resist the loss of another retail use. There have been previous appeal decisions for changes away from retail uses, and these are summarised at page 57 of the report, and inspectors have found in the Council's favour in those cases. The core strategy policy is relatively new and up-to-date, and should therefore carry significant weight in the determination of this application. The Council have been more flexible and focused in terms of retail policy, and it's considered that any further losses of Class A1 retail uses would have an adverse impact on the viability and character of the prime shopping area. Our strategy has generally been to only allow for flexibility in the primary frontage where it would help to combat a long-term vacancy. This clearly isn't a long-term vacancy, and the fact that an A1 occupier, the art shop, has taken the space shows that there is demand for A1 properties in this frontage, and this issue will carry uh, considerable weight against the application. So our recommendation is to refuse permission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have a speaker on behalf of the applicant, uh, Mr Malkin. Are you there, Mr Malkin? Um, would you... I don't know which is the... Can you speak from there? Is, is that acceptable? Is that working? Is that, yeah. Yeah. The idea is that we get you on the recording. That's the idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you have three minutes. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, members of the Planning Committee, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of our client's application, 46 St. Peter Street. As background to the application, the applicant, Mr. Inlam, and his business partner, Hamid Youssef, opened a store called Heavenly Desserts, of which you may be aware, in 2009. They now have 18 stores across the country, with 10 more in the pipeline. Um, they're also open to open international stores in 2019, and their head office is based um, here in Derby. Feats, Feats 33 is a new venture that follows on from the success of Heavenly Desserts um, and also follows the concept. It already has an established premises on Upper Parliament Street in Nottingham and is in the process of opening its second store in Leicester. Um, the business is based entirely on the sale of, of Belgian Feats, which can be accompanied by any number of 33 sauces or 10 spice mixes um, that will be offered. Feats 33 will operate as a quick service restaurant with a takeout facility which is comparable to the operations of Greggs and McDonald's which are, are nearby. The use will not be comparable to a hot food takeaway. It is a bespoke destination eatery which will operate alongside town centre retail uses and will not operate under the same late night closing hours that characterise most hot food takeaway businesses. The proposal will have a strong active frontage to the street. The applicant has chosen Derby as it fulfils all of his criteria in terms of location and footfall. It is important the council understand that the building has only been temporarily occupied since January uh, 2018, following the closure of game, and FHP property consultants have advised that there has been no long-term um, interest in, in the property. Um, they have also advised that the, the retail units in Derby City Centre have been particularly badly affected by the development and success of the Into Shopping Centre, which is in a large number of stores moving away from the traditional high street. Both Canervo Lounge, a cafe bar, and Pound Bakery have recently opened on St. Peter's Street, um, both of which we believe operate under an A3 and A5 consent. Feet 33 will operate in a very similar manner to these businesses and should not be subject to arbitrary restrictions in location. Members will be fully aware that there is a high frequency of empty units in close proximity to the application site, a number of which have been vacant for well over two years. The condition of the vacant units detract significantly from the character and appearance of St Peter's Street, as well as not encouraging potential occupiers to the area. The opening of a new niche restaurant, which offers alternative cuisine, will undoubtedly increase footfall in the immediate area and will contribute towards the vitality of St Peter's Street. We feel that bringing the application site back into active use and the associated benefits of the vitality of the area should be given significant weight in the decision-making process. The proposal will initially result in the creation of five full-time jobs and ten part-time jobs, which are a significant benefit arising from the, uh, from the scheme. There are no technical issues in relation to the application, and the environmental protection team raised no objections. 
The applicant has a proven track record in operating a similar style of store and is investing heavily in Freets 33 on the back of the success of Heavenly Desserts and anticipates the brand will be in city centres across the country over the next few years. Um, Marketing Derby have also supported the proposal and I quote, the St Peter's quarter suffered economic downturn in 2008 owing to competition from online trading and excessive business rates. St Peter's Street, currently designated as a primary shopping area, is no longer relevant. There are high vacancies and outdated restrictions. The opening of Freets 33 will ensure a balance of uses on the street, continuing the positive impact, increasing footfall and vibrancy. Thank you. Very good timing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hussain, would you like to address the committee? Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak on this item um, and dealing with it as first item on the agenda. It's not very often that I actually come and address planning committee because I have two colleagues who do a wonderful job. But on this issue, I felt strongly that I wanted my voice to be heard by the planning committee. And the reason is, I'm not sure we are actually keeping up with recent developments in the retail sector. The, the rapid change in the retail sector has left many uh, local authorities gasping for breath as far as changes to the planning regulation and laws are concerned, and I think we are probably one of those authorities. There are currently seven um, vacant units in St. Peter Street, and the likelihood is that they're likely to increase as time goes on. And at some point, we have to reconsider uh, earmarking of St. St. Peter Street as solely being uh, suitable for A1 usage. I mean, obviously, as society is changing very rapidly and with the development of the intercentre uh, and uh, uh, St. Peter's uh, sorry, Cathedral Quarters, uh, as has been pointed out by uh, Marketing Derby, um, where retailers are looking for uh, a significant level of footfall, they are going into, into. And where people are focusing on uniqueness and quality, they're more likely to look at themselves uh, in cathedral quarter. So therefore, the St. Peter's uh, Street is actually branched between the two, in a sense. And for, for us to find a significant number of retailers who are actually uh, interested in renting out space uh, in St. Peter's uh, Street is going to remain on decline. And nationally, the trend is more and more entrepreneurs are actually uh, interested in serving food-related um, items, and those business businesses are probably on the growth in most major cities. This organization, which is actually trying to provide this service, is quite unique because they appear to be very quick at spotting new trends, as they have shown with dessert shops and various other, th uh, other businesses of similar nature up and down the country, especially in Midlands. They've got virtually an establishment in most of the cities around here. So it's a good business. They're not by any means fly-by-night operators, and I think they will lend the area uh, stability in terms of businesses being located there for quite some time to come, and actually will help us attract more people coming into that area for the uniqueness of the cuisine that they, are, uh, that, that they want to serve from that area. So I very strongly actually uh, support this application, and I think we should be more flexible to, to accommodate in, in a changing time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hussain. Again, good, very good timing. Um, can somebody confirm my understanding of A1 uh, use class is that you can sell pretty well anything retail, including food. But if you heat that food up, cook it, and sell it, it ceases to be A1 which to me sounds a bit daft, quite honestly. I could sell you a sandwich, but I can't sell you a hot dog. What is really the big difference there? I, I can't see it, but that is what the use classes say, and we have to obey them. We've had plenty of situations where, it comes to mind, Chatterston Lane End, Chatterston on Nottingham Road there, and at Alverston so often, we get lots and lots of objections to a new hot food shop. And we're told, well, they haven't uh, taken over the place. There's still room for another one. Um, this is next door to McDonald's. And when I first saw this application, I said, oh, that's next door to McDonald's. There can't be a problem with that. 
But we do have this problem of a policy which we make, uh, which not this committee, but can be changed. Or we, if we make exceptions to it, will we be able to turn down things elsewhere? That's the dilemma. It's not just a matter of whether this is a sensible thing to have in this place. Anyway, Councillor Rawson, you actually brought this to committee, so uh, perhaps it's best if we let you have your say first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did indeed um, request that this application uh, come to committee to um, facilitate this debate amongst members. Um, officers had recommended refusal, um, but I think we do need to consider um, whether a refusal is in the best interests of um, a healthy and vibrant city centre. Um, St Peter Street is protected by um, the policy uh, seeking to protect it as a wholly retail destination, um, although the report does acknowledge um, exceptions have already been made um, and indeed can be under the existing policy. Um, I think we have to accept that the world is changing very quickly in the world of retail, uh, whether we like that or not. Um, beginning probably 10 years ago with the financial crash, the recession, a long period of low wage growth which has impacted on people's disposable income and of course the rise of the internet which gives uh, people convenience, choice and lower prices due to lower overheads um, of the, the online retailers um, without the costs that are associated with those that have got premises to maintain. Uh, and all of that has hit um, the traditional bricks and mortar retail, not just in Derby, but in, in high streets up and down the UK. Um, the success of Into as well um, has also changed the dynamics. Um, and uh, as has been said, it, it's a very attractive um, destination for a lot of the national retailers. So we find ourselves with um, a large number of empty retail premises on St Peter Street and elsewhere and I think we have to balance the policy objective of seeking to retain these frontages for retail against some of the very serious negative impacts um, that empty shop premises have. Um, it creates a poor impression of Derby, damages the reputation of the city, generates media coverage and comments and hits the confidence both, both of residents uh, and investors. And it makes attracting investment into Derby all the more difficult, um, as has been highlighted by Marketing Derby uh, and the St Peter's Quarter bid, um, who do both support this application. Um, I don't actually advocate changing the policy overall uh, or uh, allowing all pre premises um, a change of use automatically. Um, I do think that we need to consider each one on its own merits, um, but we do need to be flexible. And the other cases that are mentioned in the report, I think one was an a, a, a amusement arcade and one was a betting shop, um, I think it, it, it was right that they they were turned down because they wouldn't add to um, the vibrancy and the um, the quality that um, that you would want on the main uh, shopping street in the city centre. Um, but I think in this case, um, I do support the application. Um, it's a, it's a good quality. Um, uh, operator um, that's coming in here. The plans are of a high quality and would fit in. Um, and I think on balance, when taking into um, account the, the negative impact that um, potentially uh, that and other empty shops have along that main street in Derby, um, in this case, um, I, do, I, do, I do support um, the application. Um, but um, um, welcome the views of other members of the committee and uh, I did feel it important rather than the decision being taken under delegation that um, this is an important issue for the city and rightly it should be discussed by ourselves as elected members. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Sheriff Khan. Thank you uh, Chair. Uh, I agree with Councillor Rawson in terms of bringing it uh, to the committee. It's an, it is an important issue, especially for uh, Derby City Council in terms of revenue and what have you. But I mean, the city centre is in my ward, 
and St. Peter Street is in my ward. I, I would like to see an equal treatment, uh, you know, for other parts of the ward as well as this. Now, those of us that are old enough or have lived long enough here in Derby will know that this was once a thriving area, you know, with sort of, uh, you had uh, shoe retailers like Lillian Skinner and Peter Brown and all them shops here, Jackson's Tailors and all sorts, right? But unfortunately, you know, that's not going to come back. And if you're a retailer now, would you want to come here where the footfall is, you know, sort of <laughs> so much less compared to the Intu Center? And whilst, as I said, we all would like to see that time come back, it's not going to come back. We've recently seen the closure of Greenwoods, which was a clothing shop, and seven units available in that stretch of street is, is far too many. What are we doing with that? It's costing us revenue. Whilst I wouldn't like to see all of them shops occupied with the takeaways and other sort of hot food outlets, but this is something different. It's next to uh, McDonald's. We have Greg's, which is a cake shop. And I don't see any problem with somebody, you know, the officer mentioned odor. Well, look, if they can stand the odor of McDonald's fries, I'm sure they won't man, you know, mind Belgian fries, right? So it's, you know, it's not a question of odor. I think as a you know, sort of authority and as a committee, we have to be, yes, responsible, mindful of the fact that it's going to have in further application. But in this instance, bringing somebody to, uh, something to a unit that's you know, temporarily occupied by a game shop and now a pop-up retail is hardly, you know, sort of, we can't say that this is a unit that's been occupied by a closed shop or some high street retail. It's not. You know, it's barely sort of occupied on a temporary basis. So I think if somebody's bringing 15 jobs to this area, offering something different that's not in Derby City Centre at the moment, those people around there who have retail shops, obviously McDonald's won't agree with it, and we've already heard another competitor is, say, is saying that you know they, they, they don't want it. But other shops around that area will probably welcome the increase of football, footfall that this uh, you know business will, will bring. And as I said, I, I would love to see clothing and shoe shops and leather goods and all sorts. It's not going to happen. The question we have to ask ourselves is: Are we prepared to let these units you know stay empty? Uh, look an eyesore, and as well as that, costing us revenue. So I think on, on this particular application, I would go along with Councillor Rosen and say that, uh, yes, I, I'd like to see this approved purely and simply on the basis that it's something different. It's bringing revenue, bringing jobs, and it's going to increase the footfall of those <laughs> businesses that are already in, in this area. Thank you. Any other members of the committee? Councillor Howard, Councillor Weston, then... Well, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I endorse everything that the other councillors have said. Um, it's far better to have a unit occupied, particularly as there's so many unoccupied in this area. And another important factor is, of course, that we're encouraging a lot of people to come and live within the city centre. A lot of those people will be professional people who in the evening will hopefully go to places like this uh, and uh, do business there, which will encourage, as was rightly said, a lot of more footfall in the city centre. And that's what we need badly. So I endorse what they've said and we'll be voting accordingly. Councillor West. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose, being a little bit of a devil's advocate, I wonder what my fellow committee members would say if this was a different business that was approaching us with this request. Um, as has been quite rightly stated, we are looking at whether we change this to A1 retail use um, and not granting planning permission for a fantastic sounding Belgian food restaurant to go in there. Um, I think my worry would be, what do we do if we do change it to, to A1 usage and the um, Free 33 pulls out for whatever reason? Um, and we're left with another unit with A1 usage that someone comes along with that we wouldn't have agreed to at this stage. Um, I'm not convinced that turning this to A1 use would necessarily increase the vibrancy of St. Peter Street. And I do wonder whether changing this to another A1 usage, whether that would actually put off future 
retailers from um, requesting permission to set up in St Peter's Street. So that's my, my thought. Thanks, yeah, Jeff. I'll just point out that A1, it's A1 at the moment. It's, the, the request is to change to A3 stroke 5. Yeah, OK. I, I, I accept what you're saying. Um, Councillor Kerr. Yeah, um, I was going to raise the issue which Councillor Howard has in terms of we're encouraging city living and therefore there is likely to be a growth of the number of people who want to eat out in the evenings. And offices, people may eat out during the day as well. So both of those are compatible with, with upper floor uses and other things we're doing in the city centre. And I also was concerned about the changeover. We're changing the nature of this. If, if this business doesn't make it, somebody else might be there instead. Uh, but it is a commercial area. We complain about um, hot food going into residential areas. Yes, this is residential as well, because we want it to be. But we know its, it's primary purpose is city centre. The other side of this, which we haven't really explored, is that as the number of vacant properties appear, it will become a time when landlords recognise there is a market out there for a1 retail, but they can't stand the really high rental costs for that property. And the the price of rental for A1 is going to have to fall. Now, um, from the point of view of landlords, and they're going to have to be um, accepting that maybe they want to sell this property to somebody else rather if they can't make the income they want from it. Now, I don't know what, at which point we as an authority need to balance that with the desire to have vibrant frontages. I think this is a really difficult situation. We wouldn't want to have 50% of our frontages empty while we wait for those rental costs to fall. Um, and that's what we might have to do. So we've, we've got a bit of a dilemma here. Um, in my case, I think that we can accept another one because we are also pushing for the city centre living and we have passed um, we've approved schemes fairly recently which will go for more city centre living and this is part of that move. But I just think we need to be really notable of that. And in terms of policy, I think it's something that we need to probably explore in a great bit more difficult, um, interest and also talk to colleagues who are involved on the, um, the economic development side of things for their advice on how we match that rental cost value floor space value against the decisions we're taking. Thank you. Uh, Ian, you'd like to yeah. come back on some of the points that have been raised. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd just point out that, of course, we've, we've got an up-to-date local plan and we have rolled back the, the primary front frontages within, within the policy in the local plan. So we have understood that we need to be flexible in the offer in the city centre. And that's reflected along this frontage with Canaro Lounge and the uh, Poppin British Legion shop. So the various um, um, concessions have been made. And we went out to consultation, marketing derby, the St. Peter's quarter bid, could all <coughs> get involved in that process and understand what the policy is all about. Now, it's the main um, thoroughfare in town. It takes people up to the uh, into shopping centre and we feel it's got an important retailing presence and as Stephen highlighted there's only 30 percent of occupiers currently in A1 use and as Councillor West pointed out and is included in the report we could grant uh, a permission uh, for an A3 A5 split use but it wouldn't be personal it would be an open-ended uh, permission so anybody could move in there and, and our fear is that, A, we, we, we want to encourage the retailing um, option because of the, the low uh, level of percentage occupiers uh, under the A1 use bracket. And we don't want uh, to be left in a situation where it's a relatively short-term vacancy. Uh, and there might be a retailer who, who has got an interest and there might be other retailers out there looking for, for, for this kind of unit. Uh, and I think that we have to be mindful that it's not a personal permission and we have got an up-to-date local plan that's been through a very long consultation process where people have been asked to comment on the on the rationale behind all these policies and this is where we've arrived at through a thorough examination and um, I really do promote the recommendation I appreciate what members are saying 
in terms of the offer in the city centre and the, the levels of investment and the perception of the city centre, but I would also point out that uh, we've got an up-to-date local plan. Stephen can talk about later the importance of that in the context of the new framework as a starting point for all decisions. So I appreciate where members are coming from, and, and, and Councillor Rawson himself said it is a good quality operator, but we are not granting planning permission to uh, Freaks 33. It's an A3, A5 potential planning permission, which could go to uh, any user. So I would apply that caution and uh, promote um, the policy as to how we've arrived at it through a, a process of consultation. It's not out of date and it's not an old policy. Thank you. Um, Councillor Posser, Councillor Khan and then Councillor Harwood and then I think we need to move to a vote otherwise a lot of people who are waiting to hear other applications have already waited 35 minutes. Uh, so Councillor Potter. Thank you Chair. Uh, we are in the middle of a uh, health epidemic in this country and I'll just say for whatever you describe it as it's another chip shop although I love chip shops that's just you know take care of how many we do have in society. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Potter. That was material consideration there. But uh, yeah, just uh, you know, come back on a couple of points that have been made. Well, look, if we look at district centres, some of them, you know, they, they have takeaways. They also have florists next to it and, you know, sort of candy shops and all sorts. I don't see how having something like this is going to stop people that want to actually come to an area where there's greater footfall from opening other shops. I mean, you know, Ian mentioned going up to, you know, a few hundred yards away from St. Peter's Street to uh, the Intu Centre. Well, go along another five, six hundred yards and you come onto Normanton Road where you see takeaways, restaurants, clothes shops, shoe shops, florists, you know, gaming shops, you name it, and, and they're there. So if anybody, you know, is, is worried about the fact that, yeah, this is a class operator and they may leave, well, let's look at it logically. If somebody who's bespoke is not going to make this pay, then how is an independent takeaway owner going to come and make this pay? So I, I think, you know, we have to be mindful. Yes, we should be fair, fearful in case, you know, we're flooded with that. But market forces dictate, you know, expenditure dictates w what happens here. So, you know, I, I honestly can't think why we should be worried about it. Yes, as I said to you earlier on, you know, we'd love to see retail. It's not going to happen. We know that because it's seven units empty, and we, we know that uh, what was here is they're thinking about relocating. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Khan, and welcome aboard um, market forces. And, uh, <laughs> I won't say any more. Councillor Harwood. Right, thank you, Chair. Well, normally I'd go along with Mr Woodhead and what he says, but when marketing Derby and St Peter's quarter bid, amongst others, say, yes to this, then I'm afraid that I will have to say, Mr Woodhead, I don't agree with you on this. Marketing Derby and those other people are for it, as I am. Thank you. Is there anybody else desperately wants to speak who hasn't? Okay. Um, the recommendation, and to me this is between policy, which we might need to enforce other, in other places, and common sense. Okay, and I know which one I'm going for, but um, let's see. The recommendation is to refuse um, permission. Those in favour of the recommendation as printed? That's one, two. Um, those against refusing? Okay, that is, let's count them. Eight. Eight, okay. Um, at this point, we haven't granted permission, so um, if the recommendation were to grant permission, there would be a lot of conditions. Um, I would suggest that somebody proposes we grant permission and allow the officers to come up with the appropriate commission, uh, conditions, and that those conditions, to my way of thinking, should not be any harsher than apply to McDonald's next door. Okay, um, so that, Councillor Harwood has proposed that. Councillor Khan has seconded it. Those in favour then of granting uh, permission conditionally? That's. Got me. Nine, sorry. So that's nine. Those against? 
uh, as before too. Okay, so permission for Freet, um, change of use, has been granted. Councillor Kerr, you want to raise a point of order? I just want no. I just wanted to talk about the conditions because I think it would be a bad thing for this to be a shop front that is closed most of the normal shopping hours. And I think one of the conditions we might, you know, often we put conditions on hot food to say they should not open beyond a certain time at night. But I think this is one where we should expect to have it open during normal shopping hours. And I'd like officers to consider that as part of their review. I'm sure they will, but of course, Councillor Cowan's market forces will uh, no doubt dictate um, the, the hours they want to be open. S thank you for that. Um, now, if we want to see which we move on to. Uh, I think, eight, well, which, sorry, suggesting Baker Street, that Baker got, Street got was, was, was um, yeah, there's a lot of people interested in that. And who's going Let's to... Go so Mr Woodhead is going to introduce the uh, application at 277 Baker Street, Alveston, uh, which is on page one. Thank you, Chair. Just to update the report, on page three, references made at the top of the page uh, to the third bullet point under paragraph 32 of the framework. Now, you'll, you'll all know that this relates to the superseded version. And this paragraph has been replaced by paragraphs 108, 109, and 110 in the July version. So that just needs to be amended and noted. On to the main report, Chair. Your report concentrates on the key issues with this proposal, uh, which is a change of use to a house in multiple occupation. Uh, and the main issues centre on the immunity impact of this residential use for existing local residents and the impact of the proposal on on-street parking conditions along Baker Street. The application has generated 31 objections and these are supported by councillors Graves and Bayliss. And of course these objections are summarised in your report. Members will of course be aware that the issue of changing a dwelling house to a large scale seven bed house in multiple occupation needs to be considered in the context of what can potentially be achieved at the dwelling as either a large scale family household occupation or a small scale house in multiple, multiple occupation for up to six people. The latter can be achieved as a permitted change under the use classes order, so we have to be very mindful of that context. And in that context, Chair, I think it, it would be extremely difficult to demonstrate that the proposed seven bed accommodation would be injurious to surrounding amenities above and beyond what can occur presently and potentially under a permitted change. I've also sought background information from our environmental health team uh, and the other recorded uh, large-scale house in multiple occupation on Baker Street and it appears that one currently exists at number 303. As the report states, Chair, there are no objections to the proposal in terms of the internal living conditions from the Housing Standards Team subject to a range of guidelines and licensing under separate legislation. The pro proposed extension as shown in footprint on the Ordnance Survey base on screen is a reasonable proposition in terms of its layout, scale and impact uh, given the size of the plot and the aspect of the plot and we feel that's an acceptable addition to the building in terms of the impact for those immediate neighbours. On balance, therefore, Chair, I consider that the recommendation is sound and meets policy, and in this case, you have five speakers to address committee. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like Mr Whale to speak first on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, Auburn Living um, is a relatively new business venture. Uh, into property investment and uh, buy and hold strategies to rent um, under a HMO uh, or house of multiple occupation strategy. Um, Auburn Living Limited pride themselves on providing high quality shared houses for the working professionals of Derby uh, using Scandinavian design and an ethical and moral approach to rental properties, we believe we provide homes with, which reflect what renting should be rather than have to be like. Uh, the company saw potential to convert 277 Baker Street into a seven-bed house in multiple occupation. 
Um, HMOs have unfortunately received very bad press over the years with many of the reasons attributed to undesirable tenants and very poor landlord management. Uh, the HMOs that we currently have in our portfolio are all managed by ourselves. Um, as directors, we have taken over 120 hours of property investment training provided by the biggest and most prolific property investment company in the world. A large proportion of this training has included uh, training on HMO specifically from an investment and management standpoint. We also have accredited status with the National Landlords Association, so we have completed the training modules that the NLA provide in relation to letting property and letting law and must provide evidence of our continued professional development to remain accredited. Our tenant profile is one of those who are working professionals. Our tenants work in a variety of areas at the moment. 60% are employees of Rolls-Royce, 30% are employed by the University Hospitals of Derby and Burton, and 10% are in other sectors, Bombardier, events management, retail, and consultancy. Only 40% of our tenant profile are in a form of transport, as most are graduates from university having secured their first job. Um, they will opt for house shares with excellent transport links for their place of work and into town and local amenities. Most of these employers also have multiple locations of work, especially Rolls-Royce with sites elsewhere, for example Coventry and Bristol, with employees expected to work across all locations. We've been advised that periods of work may well last for six months in one location before having to move to another location. Uh, this is why our uh, HMO setup where Auburn Living is all inclusive of bills and council tax so the, but the tenant can budget effectively as there are no hidden payments during uh, the month. The tenant does also not have to set up to pay the bills in each location they are in as this is all done by us. In relation to parking amenities I refer the highways report completed or published on the 1st of August which comments on balance that the Highway Authority cannot argue that the impact of the development will be severe. Thank you for that. Um, everybody's getting dead on three minutes this evening. That's, that's excellent. Thank you, Mr. Whale. Well. Um, uh, the next speaker will be Ms. Adams. Ms. Adams? Okay. You press the button, the little light will come on. And you get three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Chair. I reside at 259 Baker Street. My objections for the planning application for 277 Baker Street are the parking concerns. Um, many residents struggle at the minute to get parked outside their own properties, especially the disabled. And access for emergency car paramedics they often waste valuable time <clears throat> excuse me trying to get parked outside the patient's residence if this plan is allowed it will also set a precedent for other family homes that are up for sale on the street currently i therefore urge you to reject this proposal thank you thank you um <coughs> And we also have uh, Mr. Aveline. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I would like to follow on by saying I moved into Baker Street in 03. And at the time, there was a smell of sewage in the street. And there still is and we are told the sewers aren't deep enough. If this precedent is set, as Lynn has suggested, there could be dozens, nay hundreds of new individuals living in Baker Street, each one of which will want to go to the loo. Is the sewage system going to be adequate before you make a decision to a deal with significant extra demand upon the sewage system? On the second side, of course, is to do with the Public Health Act, and one wonders how they would feel if that got worse. The other side of the question for me is the water supply, because at the back of my house there's a bit of lead coming out with a hole in it, 
produced to feed water to the outside lab. I can't put my little finger into that hole. Now, every time we go to the loo, you lose another two and a half litres of water. We're now looking at dozens and hundreds of extra people trying to use it. Can you assure us, before you grant this commission, that the water supply will be adequate for the additional demand rather than the current demand? And tell us whether or not we, the council, or the council payers have to pay, or will that be taken up by Seven Trent? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two ward councillors who would like to speak. Have you agreed who's going to speak first? Okay, Councillor Bayliss. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm here to ask the committee to reject the application, as you did with the previous two applications in uh, Olveston Ward. The reasons are, as you've outlined, actually, car parking primarily is uh, inadequate, and, and on the street it's heavily parked. There's no off-road parking at the actual location itself. Uh, and while Baker Street is long, it can be very difficult to park sometimes with vehicle parks opposite spaces. And as all outlined, sometimes there's issues of access for emergency services, particularly ambulances. In respect of housing standards, in respect of the HIMO, the layout of the house, in my opinion, is not very good, poor and barely adequate, and we should be asking for good quality design, exceeding medium and standards, and aspiring for excellence in design, uh, and not allowing developers to get away with poor designs. This application, if allowed, will be effectively another de-gentrification in respect of urban design. It is likely that this sort of property, again, will be maintained probably at the lower standards possible to maximise the income for the landlord and will, in time, potentially becoming a bit of an eyesore on the street scene. And that will have a detrimental effect on the resale price of nearby properties and the area generally. So, overall, Chair, we need to reject this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Graves. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the Planning Committee, all too often local residents remain reliant on sensible decisions by this Council. The numerous objections indicate a feeling of despair by neighbours and visitors to Baker Street. Baker Street suffers from many difficult issues not envisaged when it was built and designed. Since it was built, it has speed humps installed to slow traffic down and deter the rat running that occurs. Designed as family homes, many have already be been converted to flats and houses of multiple occupation. There is even a current planning permission to build 12 houses in the garden space of five existing properties, despite legislation that allowed councils to prevent this, known as garden grabbing. I ask you, when is enough is enough? I believe this is a case of precedent has gone too far. Please help the local community rather than hinder it. There are clear negative effects on amenity. Seven individuals make more noise than two to four family members. Family life is being deteriorated by offering temporary accommodation in its place. The disturbance factor is again very high. Seven individuals coming and going impacts a lot more on local people's lives. Nuisance. The sheer nuisance value of increased human activity, including parking highlighted by many objectors, bin capacity, etc., etc. I believe this is overdevelopment and out of character of one of Derby's oldest streets. The living accommodation of seven temporary tenants actually has a negative impact on the local area. This part of Alveston suffers from crime, like many areas of Derby, only there has been an increase in drug taking and dealing. I have had far too many reports in the last five years of open drug dealing from people on bikes, from cars and from specific houses. I would like to draw your attention to this Derbyshire Drug Police Prevention Leaflet, titled Do You Suspect an Address is Being Used for de Drug Dealing, which states, Signs to look out for, usually takes place in a multi-occupancy or social housing property. Passing this application increases the risk of drug problems to the local vicinity. I read Adam uh, Wales of Aban Living's response, and I would say this to you. They would say that, wouldn't they? Of course, they have every intention of ensuring professional people are housed in the HMO. Examples not too far away suggest those good intentions will fade away when professional people vote with their feet. Brindley Court, less than half a mile away from here, was redeveloped for professional people with facilities such as private communal sauna and steam room. The building now houses a mixture of decent people and problematic people with open drug dealing taking place daily. Please do not let this happen to Baker Street. Um, Mr Woodhead, would you like to come back on any of the points raised? Well, just, just, just uh, Mr Aveline mentioned uh, a couple of points. It, 
I mean, Seven Trent Water are the, the water company who will deal with those issues in terms of your, the, the, foul, the foul sewage issue and the water supply and how that's maintained. Um, I, yeah, just highlight, Chair, that this is um, a residential area and it's a residential use and we're talking about a seven bedroom house in multiple occupation compared to what could be achieved in a large scale family household or a permitted change six bed house in multiple occupancy. So um, I feel like there's no way to go here, Chair, in terms of resisting this application. I mean, Paul can talk about the on-street parking conditions, but again, those what can be achieved presently or potentially will, will create similar um, parking issues. Thank you, Chair. Paul, um, right. would you like to tell us about uh, the parking issues? Thank you, Chair. Um, Essentially, yes, the development will almost certainly generate extra traffic, but it would be my advice to the committee is that there wouldn't be any justification for refusal because it's not a, it would be difficult to say it was a severe impact, very difficult to demonstrate that. Marginal impact, in other words. Uh, yes, I think so. Well, we wouldn't be able to, to, to demonstrate it was severe because it, it, it just couldn't. We would need severe impact that's right the mpf sustain an objection yep. on appeal okay not to want to put words in your mouth but yeah <laughs> you're agreeing with me thank yes. you uh, councillor west thank you chair um so whilst i'm not sure drug dealing falls under the remit of this committee and i'm not casting any such aspersions on the developers or any possible renters um i think the question has to be does Baker Street really need another house of multiple occupancy? Um, I'd really like to know, there's nothing in the report that says how many um, HMOs there are on Baker Street or in the, or in the vicinity. Um, I suspect that policy GD5 seems to be the only one where we have any grounds of, of refusal, just under, um, I forgot what it says, it says it on page five, but to do with massing, to do with um, a satisfactory living environment for those that are there. I know the street well. Um, I visit it fairly regularly, thanks to Councillor Bayliss. Um, I can't support this recommendation. I think it's an absolutely ridiculous suggestion that we should go ahead with it. I think that the um, area is absolutely over-intensive and... Um, Whilst I don't want to agree with everyone that's spoken, I'm afraid I'm going to have to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other members of the committee? Uh, Councillor Harwood and Councillor Kerr. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've got a real problem here because whilst I agree with the eloquent way that the two councillors put it, we have got a real problem here because if there's only six people for this property, we want to be here at all, discussing it, because they don't need planning permission. So one further, if it's likely to go to appeal, I think we very much lose that appeal. And quite honestly, at the end of the day, the other thing, of course, is that there's a house just up the road, on the corner, a bit further along, against the jitter there, 303, that's already got this permission. It's already in being. So to me, whilst I appreciate the problems of Baker Street, and what the councillors have said, I don't think we've got a leg to stand on because it goes to appeal, we'll lose. Councillor Kerr. I am really disappointed in the applicants because looking at this site, they should have been able to anticipate that the main concern would have been traffic. And yet they have done nothing yet about putting in the obvious cycle parking for, some, for a scheme like this. So, okay, people knew I was going to say that. But we also now have, we also now have electric e-bikes in Derby, and we've, everyone's seen them zooming all over the place. We don't have any in Ulverston yet, but with a bit of luck, within the next two or three years, we might have them there, maybe sooner if we're really lucky. But even then, a lot of people will want their own bicycle. Um, I've got a son who, until recently, was living in equivalent accommodation to this in Manchester, and you know he had his bicycle there the whole time because as somebody who's... Um, a young professional, you tend to be reasonably fit, you want to go places, a bicycle is the obvious convenient answer. But no provision 
And I'm not convinced with the layout that we've got here, and I've just been unchecked at the slightly better detail we've got there. I don't know if you can put it up on the screen. Um, to see how there's going to be provision provided when we've got an extension of that size on the ground floor. Um, and if we can't achieve it, then we've got a condition here written in to say that it's needed. But it shouldn't be an add-on afterthought. It should be properly <coughs> thought out with decent access to get to it, not just something that you can get to if you struggle. It's got to be convenient. The other thing that I think is really nice about these houses is they've got lovely long gardens. And a lovely long garden is an asset to people who want to look after it. But I'm not sure what's going to encourage the residents here to take any interest in that garden at all. And a garden that's not looked after becomes a headache for its neighbours. So I don't know what the standard procedure is, but I think there should be a condition here about the garden that there needs to be access to the garden and it needs to be maintained by the people who are looking after the rest of the building. And it shouldn't be all hard covered either. So I'd like an additional condition about the garden and I would like real reassurance that not that it's going to be brought into use um, before, it's going to have cycle parking before it's brought into use. We need decent cycle parking agreed in a way that will work before they start building that extension. So I would like it to be agreed, the principle of how the cycling is going to be, cycles are going to be accommodated before we start building, not just before people move in. Other than that, I don't think we've got a leg to stand on to be able to say no to its, the principal change, but we need to make it work, and part of that is making the alternative to a car practical. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's disappointing, really, sitting here as the custodians of Derby and its buildings and feeling that we don't have a right to stop something like this on legal grounds. I find that, what are we here for? Are we a puppet show? Or are we here to truly make the decisions that the people of Derby and ourselves want and agree? So that's my first point. And, and, and really, we've got to be looking at the bigger aspect of this in, in national terms and, and what cascades down from central government. But Alveston, Baker Street, I know it very well. I lived on Baker Street in the 1980s, and, and I've lived in that part of Alveston when I was a young lad. So I used to go hedge hopping, actually. <laughs> so uh, the long gardens were quite useful. Uh, but it, it, Lucy and the other speakers are quite right. That property was a Victorian terraced house built for families with long gardens and no doubt uh, a vegetable patch and so on. And to change it so drastically now and to put people in I'm not against homes of multiple occupancy in the right setting, in the right place, but, but that is truly not the right place. It really, truly is. And the, the traffic uh, question, it, I got the impression that the answer to that was really about the movement of traffic and not, in particular, the parking. And, and I'd like to the parking issue clarified on that as well, if possible. But I certainly can't support it. I really can't. That area of Olveston should be for families. There's plenty of families that want to move into properties like that. People now want to do gardening and they want long gardens with an orchard at the bottom. And, and it lends itself to that usage of what it's designed for. So, so I really can't support, support the application. Thank you. Um. I've, I've got Councillor Rawson to speak, but uh, Mr Woodhead would like to come back on some technical points. Yeah, just, just to tidy a few things up, Chair. I mean, in terms of Councillor West, yeah, the, uh, as Councillor Harwood pointed out, the only recorded one we've got on Baker Street is at 303 in terms of environmental health licensing. So that's the other one. Uh, in terms of uh, the garden condition, Councillor Care, uh, wouldn't meet the test of reasonableness. So um, if we tried to do something like that, well, then we'd be... Uh, accused of uh, being very selective with, with our conditions, so that wouldn't meet the test, unfortunately. What I can do with the condition three, as recommended on page seven, is to put an informative note on to say that we'd be looking at good, secure internal cycle parking within a layout. If you want that expanding in, in an informative note, the, obviously the agent's here tonight and has heard about your concerns in that area, but that condition, I think, is reasonable in its current format. Um, and yes, in, in terms of the garden usage, well, um, 
residential properties are what they are now and people use gardens as they see fit so we can't apply any controls in this particular case either so um, that's all I've got to update thanks chair thank you. councillor Rawson <coughs> Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I do have real um, concerns about this, and um, we did discuss um, uh, similar applications last time, and the issues are uh, rather similar. Um, we've got a terrace street here, um, we've got limited parking. Um, the report says that demand is already high on the street uh, for parking. Um, most of the residents rely on on-street parking, there's, I think the report says there's one or two that have got other provision, but typically um, most residents need to uh, park on Baker Street itself. And what we're talking about here is going from two bedroom property to a seven bedroom property. So potentially from one or two vehicles to potentially seven vehicles um, attached to this particular property. Um, so that that does raise concerns uh, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Um, Councillor um, Cares raised the issue of there's, there's no cycling pro pro uh, provision proposed, so um, there's no mitigation um, associated um, with that impact um, on the street. Um, I think there is a question as well about the um, the, um, the extension to the property and um, the massing and the effect that that may have on neighbours. Um, and um, the issues it, it, it raises to me just are, um, um, is this really a suitable change in this location? And because another member of committee said, um, you know, houses of multiple occupation can work very well in certain locations, but they need the infrastructure around them to be able to support them. And I do have uh, real concerns about this, uh, this individual case that we're considering tonight, Chair. Thank you. Did you want to come back about the parking issue? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The question about parking, if you read my observations on page two, I've done a very coarse assessment about the additional number of vehicles that would be likely to be attracted to the development. That comes up to roughly three to four additional vehicles, but that's on the assumption that there are only two vehicles associated with the current use which obviously if there are six units there, it could be significantly higher. But that's, as a go back to what I said previously, that I don't feel that we could argue that that would be a severe impact on the street. Councillor Pegg. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, as probably one of the only councillors with so many houses of multi-occupancy in his ward, um, I personally would say reject this out of hands because they create us that much, that many problems in our site, in, in, in our ward, it is unbelievable. It's not just the, uh, it's the bins and everything else. You've got seven houses there, where are they going to put the bin? Who's going to drag the bin out and put, put, put them out and, and everything else? Um, you know, there's, there's all this to be taken into consideration and it's, you can guarantee at some point, there will be a sign hanging from the house saying, room to let, rooms to let. And they will stay there forever and a day because, like everybody else, they will manage to turn around and say, we've still got one room left. And this is what happens all the time. And the whole area then becomes to look, look a mess and an eyesore. My, I'm turning around and saying, object to it. I know they can go away and put a six-bedroom one there, but having... Having, having to deal with these sorts of properties on a daily, daily basis, it is a nightmare. Councillor Khan. Very quickly, Chair. I mean, I don't think there's any one of us here that actually is in favour of this, right? But the question we've got to ask our uh, planning officer and legal officer, is there anything in sort of planning ground that we can refuse this on? And in terms of the legality, would we be seen to be unreasonable and have costs awarded against us? So I, I totally agree with what's been said. Uh, I don't think it's suitable. And as far as Councillor uh, uh, Paul has just said about multiple occupancy, well, you know, we suffer from it in, in, in our Breetham. 
You know, you have little side streets where there was a three-bedroom house, there's been loft conversions and extensions have been turned to seven, eight, and I would like to see a stop to this, right? But is there something that we can do within planning law and in terms of, uh, you know, how we stand on, on appeal grounds? I think I know the answer, but uh, <laughs> Ian, would you like to tell us again? Well, in, in the words of my um, dearly departed colleague, John Stewart, I think we would be roundly stranded at appeal chair in this case because what you can achieve um, with a dwelling house in terms of the occupancy, with a six-bed HIMO in terms of occupancy and vehicle ownership, we're in a sustainable location. We've got no objections from our highways colleagues and housing standards who will license, license this have got separate control. So I think in terms of planning policy and our position, I would defer to Councillor Harwood's previous comment that we would lose an appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Khan said he didn't think anybody would be in favour of this. Does anybody want to live in a house in multiple occupation? No, of course you don't. Using the, sharing the bathroom and the loo with total strangers, nobody wants to do that. But we do have people in this city, quite a lot of them, who come here to work, come here for apprenticeships, work in our hospitals, who we may, you know, our lives might depend on them at some point or other, and they're not paid an awful lot of money, and they can't afford to buy their own house or to rent one that is totally their own. If there were no market for HMOs, they wouldn't exist. So there are people who do want to live in these places. We've heard elected councillors this evening saying that people who live in multiple occupation deal drugs. They can't maintain their gardens. They can't decide who's going to put the bin out. Well, I disagree with you, I'm afraid. And I think that is a terrible th position to be in that we sit here comfortably saying, oh yes, we're all in our nice smug houses. And before you say, well, he hasn't got one near him, I have one two doors away from me, and it does cause parking problems. But I would rather that house was occupied by people who are going to work in the city that uh, will contribute to this economy. So I'm in favor of this. Um, we've heard from the applicant that a lot of these people do that sort of job. We have to weigh the truth of that uh, with experience. But I do feel coming to a, a planning committee and discriminating against a whole group of people simply because of the type of dwelling they live in is a bit much. Councillor Howard. Chair, for what it's worth, I'd like to associate me, myself with what you've said, because I agree with you. Councillor Khan. Yeah, just to clarify, Chair, I, I didn't say I'm not in favour, or all of us are not in favour of houses of multiple occupation. I was merely talking about this particular application. As I said to you, you know, I, I remember when our families come over in the 50s, they lived in houses of multiple occupation. It is a necessity. Not everybody can afford to have flats. Not everybody can afford to buy. I merely stated that this particular application, you'll find that the members don't want it. That's why I asked, is there any way we can turn it down? The recommendation is to grant planning permission with conditions. Those in favour? Yes, the usual cycling uh, provision. That is. Councillor, can you raise your hands properly so that we can be seen? Thank you. Okay. Those against? Seven. Seven against granting permission, four in favour. Therefore, we have not granted permission. Would somebody like to put forward um, an alternative suggestion, proposal? Presumably that it be refused. Hmm. Councillor Rawson, thank you. Yeah, well, it'll be consistent. You'll be an expert in the subject. Is, is that seconded? Councillor Evans to second. Sorry, can we have some reasons? Uh, yeah, the reasons, please, for refusal. Yeah, um, quoted GD5. GD5, GD5 uh, Chair, in terms of amenity uh, and unacceptable harm to amenity of nearby areas. And um, 
transport as well. Uh, cumulative exactly. impact of uh, transport, uh, sure. parking okay. problems. Sorry, can I just? I think it would be very difficult to justify um, a highways ground, as as the highways officer has already sort of explained. Um, I mean, just to quote from the new NPPF, it actually says. Um, Development shall only be only be prevented or refused on highway grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residual cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. And clearly, you've heard tonight that they would not be severe from the highways officer. And, and it says you should only use that ground if they are severe. So I think, okay, I think you would we'll have real stick with GD5 then. I think yeah. GD5 um, with, with possible. Uh, a gr mutual agreement with the officers for other um, reasons. Okay. Those in favour of the refusal then? One, two, three, four. Please stick your hands right up, otherwise we can't see. Six. Just make a distinction, Chair. Yeah. yeah. Councillor Rawson, is that when you're quoting GD5, are we talking about the intensification of the use and the extension? Because you spoke about the, the nature of the extension also. So it's bringing uh, that into the equation as well, yes, the extension. Yes, uh, we support yeah. that, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, that can be put into the mix, if, yeah. if you're happy. Okay, can I take that vote again, then? Those in favour of refusal... On those grounds. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those against? One, two, three, three. Okay. Six, three. That is carried. Refusal is, is carried. Case. Thank you. Can we move now then to West Park Community School, um, which is Me again, uh, Mr. Woodhead again, and it's, um, I haven't got a page number, but we'll find it. Thank you, Chair. Just to kick off again in terms of updates, there's a, a typo on page 33 under part 5.2 of your report. We're in the fourth paragraph, references made to West Street instead of West Road. So, sack, sack the typist. Um, and secondly, for clarity, the net gain of car parking spaces on site is 19. Uh, there's reference in the officer opinion midway down page 38 to that total being 11 spaces, which is incorrect. It's a net gain of 19 so um, on to the main report chair members will note this application is before committee as a result of the level of local objections to the proposal the application is in two parts and the proposed additional two-story classroom block which you can see on screen at the top is accompanied by additional car parking in the southeastern corner of the established school site which you can see at the bottom accessed off park road as your report states, there are no objections to the proposal on green wedge policy grounds, heritage policy in the context of the highly graded stone gateways at the Park Road entrance, and our archaeologist also raises no objections, Chair. The objections from residents primarily surround the scale and form of the proposed building and the impact of the additional school capacity, which would be 150 pupils served by eight new staff on the local highway network and the associated amenity impact for those living nearby. Clearly, this is a popular secondary school and members will be aware of the citywide need to increase school capacities. Colleagues in the transport planning and highways development control arms of the division have looked at the application carefully in the context of existing travel patterns to the school, projected travel patterns and the nature of on-street car parking and activity on West Road and Park Road. I do acknowledge the concerns of local residents, Chair, and as decision makers, we have to carefully consider and weigh all the material considerations in the balance. In terms of the scale, mass, external design and layout of the proposed building, 
I'm more than satisfi satisfied that whilst there would be some visual impact for neighbouring occupi occupiers, particularly those on Devis Gardens, which you can see on screen to the east of the block, I consider that the overall impact would be well within reasonable tolerances. In terms of movement and access to the school grounds, I consider that in view of existing and projected travel movements of pupils to the site, the provision of additional covered cycle parking and the on-site provision of additional car parking for staff, the proposal is acceptable in the context of policy CP23 and the new paragraphs 109 and 110 of the framework which addresses highways and highway safety considerations. I fully appreciate that local residents or some local residents will disagree with this balance and judgment but I consider that the proposal has been properly and reasonably considered in the context of the development plan and new national planning guidance. As such, Chair, I promote the recommendation as printed and invite the speakers to address committee. Thank you very much. Before we do that, I'm going to ask Mr Davenport from the highways point of view and parking, etc., if he's anything to comment. Thank you, Chair. The issues here are ones of a very practical nature. We have a large school that's been there for a long time set and accessed via a very ancient road network. Um, the roads are not of a modern standard. They uh, vary in width. Uh, they don't have footways all the way down and some of the footways are narrow. However, they've been there a, a very long time. The, prob the, the greatest problem that I envisage and see here is on West Road because West Road has no turning space at all. And what, what appears to happen uh, is in the morning um, people who visit the school uh, tend to use the access to the school because the gates are open. It's, a, it's a, it almost like a, a D-shaped semi-round and uh, people seem to go in there and turn round. But in the evening, the, the school has chosen to shut the gate there and, I, you know, they, they, they have done that, as in my understanding, to, to effectively try and discourage people doing this. I don't know whether it's safeguarding issues or whether it's some traffic, traffic uh, sort of travel planning issue whereby, you know, if they can't turn round, people won't come in the car. Well, my understanding is that happened in about July 17, um, and people are still coming by car, unfortunately. And I, and I think the issue here is that what people tend to do, because of the narrowness of the road and the lack of turning, is that they tend to use people's driveways. And uh, I think people get quite irate. So it, it's a very practical issue here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Runcie, um, are you here? Yes, thank you. Um, on behalf of the applicant, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, working alongside the uh, applicant and following extensive uh, review and planning process, it has been identified that Derby, like many areas of the country, displays a projected increase in secondary school pupil numbers. And following significant recent growth in Derby's pupil numbers in primary education, the Council, in conjunction with the City's schools, now need to deliver the necessary secondary school capacity for children in the locations where it is needed. It must be noted that these pressures are common across the city and we'd also like to highlight to the members that the following response to these have been at Lislover Community School, where expansion works have been completed successfully, both at Benrow School and Murray Park Community School, where major expansion schemes have started, and a similar expansion scheme approved at Derby Moor Academy. The Council have also been working with the Department for Education on the new Cathedral Secondary School proposed for the City Centre. Hopefully this demonstrates the ongoing wider work being undertaken to meet the pupil demands at other school sites and provides some assurances that all other options have been extensively explored. There is a need to provide an additional 150 secondary places at West Park with critical need for 30 places for September 2019. It has not been possible to expand any other school in the area to meet the requisite demand or viable to provide a new secondary school elsewhere due to a lack of available sites. The submitted proposal before you allows the school to increase capacity from 1,300 to 1,450 pupils in a gradual increase as the pupils are admitted to the school's first admission year each September and then built up over a five-year period. It's really important to note that the final proposed capacity will be almost identical to recent numbers on roll at the school 
recent president has established where between 2003 and 2007, the school had in excess of 1,400 pupils, which included years with a higher number of pupils than the current expansion allows for. As noted in the planning report, there are traffic concerns in the areas surrounding almost every school in the country. Changes in the school's admission rules, car ownership and employment patterns within families have had a dramatic impact on the way children travel to and from school. In general, there are fewer problems in the morning as being highlighted than there are in the evening pickup. The submitted transport survey and statement clearly highlight the parents collecting nearby primary school children greatly outnumber those collecting from West Park. We acknowledge there are challenges presented to the school and local residents as a result of traffic. We would stress that West Park are and will work closely with the council to mitigate these impacts as far as possible and together in partnership with the neighbouring schools to monitor and develop a coordinated traffic strategy going forward. In addition to education and encouraging walking, cycling and park and stride, the scheme will provide 90 additional car parking spaces and additional bicycle parking spaces, thereby help reduce on-street parking by staff and promote active transport for both staff and pupils. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Runcie. Um, for my own clarification, can I ask you, you mentioned numbers of pupils back in a certain date. Are you saying the numbers have gone up or they're back to the number they used to be? Is that well, I think people numbers, speaking to the applicant in the school, obviously people numbers rise and fall over time, naturally. I think in a period sort of in the early 2000s, there were high number, higher pupil numbers at the school. They've fallen back down again um, in the intervening period until now, where obviously the demand has necessitated an increase back to similar numbers. So we're actually looking at the same number of pupils now that existed several years ago. That, that's, that's correct. That's yeah. what I wanted to clarify. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Um, and on behalf of um, the objectors, uh, Mr. Ilsley. Thank you. Good evening, councillors, planning committee. Um, I've objected to this application on several grounds. However, today I would like to address mainly one of those points, that being traffic. I sit here as a resident of West Road, um, who knowingly bought his house opposite a secondary school and next to a primary school. I expected and have tolerated the heavy traffic at the start and finish of the school day. However, this application will create a significant increase to a traffic problem already on the verge of unsafe. The applicant took advice from DCC Highways, who advised there were significant and repeated issues arriving from traffic on West Road and the surrounding area. Uh, this application fails to make any changes to any of the contributing factors to the traffic problems, but only increases the vehicle movements in line with a 12% increase in student numbers. The applicant supports the submission with a transport statement from Messrs. Jackson Purdue Lever. This concluded that the proposal had no detrimental effect on the surrounding area, which goes to show you get the answer you pay for. Unfortunately, I must point out that the report is based upon flawed data. The, uh, the vehicle counting cameras were installed and data captured on several days in early June this year, uh, during the, this being during the longest heat wave since 1976, when most people are on foot, and more crucially, it was taken after the Year 11s had finished their GCSEs and were missing from the site. Um, if the survey was undertaken on a wet November day, I can assure you this would be very different. Um, the uh, point about year 11 to be missing is confirmed by the traffic statement only being able to survey years 7 to 10. Um, committee members, with the conclusion of no detrimental effect being based upon data missing some 20% of the pupil numbers, I'm sure you'll agree the report is fundamentally flawed and therefore inadmissible as supporting evidence for this application. If you do not dismiss this application on the basis that no practical traffic measures have been suggested, there is nothing to stop both West Park and Springfield Primary submitting applications every year for incremental extensions to their site, making no provision for the effect on the local road network. DCC Highway's consultation response suggests practical measures need to be taken and the traffic measures reviewed. I would suggest that any application for each school in the vicinity is considered holistically and long-term measures for traffic management are included in planning conditions. Move the drop-off point for West Park to the old coach turning on Church Street. Enforce no access to West Road and Park Road during school drop-off and pick-up encouraging walking. Insist a new school access road is included as any part of any housing development of Acorn Way. Improve pedestrian access from Derby Road opposite Asda. Please mandate something physical councillors in the planning conditions rather than fitting cycle racks that will never be used because the road is unsafe for cycle users. And if you have time, 
consider this development to be too tall, too modern, too striking a feature colour to be placed at the front of a site along a tree-lined avenue of traditional properties where the natural topography of the site would allow similar space to be hidden at the rear with no vit visual detriment to the street scene. Thank you for your time, committee members, this evening. Thank you very much. Do you want to come back on anything there? Uh, not at the minute, thanks. Okay. okay. Um, there were a lot of suggestions there about traffic orders and goodness knows what. Uh, I, I know there are two councillors who, who wish to speak, but I'd, I'd like the highways officer to advise on those at this point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, as you can see from my report, I've suggested that um, prior to this becoming operational, then a review of both Park Road and West Road is undertaken and um, changes made if necessary. The simple problem is there's very little to be done. Uh, we can look at the traffic regulation orders, we can provide additional bollards and things if people are mounting the footway. Um, but no widening can be undertaken uh, or, or anything like that. And it, I'm afraid it's just not practical to say that we should put some sort of order, order on to stop people going to the school. This application is for 150 extra. It doesn't cover the 1,300 that's already there. They know that they do that every day now. You can't stop them doing that. I don't know of an order um, that you could really do that, um, to, to be perfectly honest. It is a problem like every school. Every school in the country it is a real difficulty for highways officers. Um, we can only manage it. All I would say is if the turning area could be made available in the PMP, that may well assist. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Rawson and Councillor Poulter, have you decided who, which of you wishes to speak first? Councillor Rawson. Um, Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just like to say well done to our, our resident there. He's, he's stolen about 70% of my um, issues and concerns. Um, and I fundamentally disagree with some of the comments made by our officer, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. I think this is a very unique situation. It's not like every other school. We've got three schools in a very close proximity. You've got Springfield Primary, which is an enhanced resource school. So that automatically sees an increase in attendance from out of area because it's a specialist provision and they come in from out of area to that and it was only less than two years ago I believe it was two years ago that that also saw an increase in numbers and had an additional um, uh, classrooms on site um, which again we did put some traffic um, we put an, an extra ac access through from Royal Hill Road um, but um, it has seen an increase because it's taxis that go to that area and has caused added pressures on and down West Road. You've also got St Werbergs as the second of the three schools, which is a C of E school, again a specialist school which many parents will come out of area to go to. So it again sees an increase of out of Spondon area students. And finally we've obviously got West Park, it's a good academy, it's a fantastic academy um, and um, again it attracts more out of areas so it's very unique in this situation it's, they're in cl such close proximity and we've done a number, number of school parking days as councillors in the area and on one occasion we actually invited the fire service down um, it was around two, uh, two years ago now um, and they invited, we invited them down and the pinch point on West Road, they were actually blocked and could not access it caused Spondon to stand still because it was that detrimental to the impact at, at the end of the school period um, I wanted to go into lots of details many of the issues that have been picked up by the gentleman before the electric gates yes they're open in the morning but there's a gentleman who stands at the front of them and stops cars going down it unless they're um, uh, individual school members which I know because I went down there not so long ago um, page 33 it says um, I'd like to dispute, of course it's material, this is safety concerns by our residents. Um, we've got 1,400 students there already, and my understanding is the numbers are already increased in that area. One of the things you've not considered is Merchant Avenue, which is an access point that people come up and down constantly and again gets blocked and needs to have a look at that. So what I'm try basically trying to say is that this is not strong enough. The comments need to be, or should read something along the lines of, further assessments need to be detailed and there needs to be implemented to address the parking concerns to make it safe for individuals. Look at 
various areas, including the, um, restricting access to West Road, addressing the issues on, on Merchant Avenue, and reinstating what was a great turning circle on Church Street stalls, which is currently a car park maintained by our parks department, um, and it could very easily become the main point of picking up and dropping off and solving a lot of the safe concerns. I will just shut you up there. Thank, thank you. Um, Councillor Poulter. Thanks, Chair. Uh, firstly, thanks for allowing me to speak out. I didn't apply before because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to be here tonight. But, uh, As if I'd be able to deny you. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. Um, Can you ask your daughter to turn off her microphone and then we'll be able to hear Okay. Um, my main concern here is around the highways assessment, that there's nothing much that can be done. We've been trying to deal with these problems for 12 years. It's, there's three schools in the area. They're all expanding at various points. Only a, a year or so, 18 months ago, uh, Springfield School expanded their capacity. We put an extra entrance in there as a mitigation. We've, we've uh, tightened the parking restrictions around the area. It's just not true. There's nothing more you can do. There needs to be more access. We can do things on, on Church Street around the turning circle. We can look at speed limits. We can look at bollards. We can look at a number of measures to make things safe. What's happening here is a cumulative effect of these three schools expanding and increasing the problem. Okay, on a restricted site, but it's just not true that there's nothing you can do about it. So what needs, at the very least, what needs to be done, the condition that, that was described as uh, we need to do what we can prior to become, this becoming operational, I think you need to look at that differently. You need to design and work up a proper raft of measures for safety purposes to mitigate the expansion of this school, along with all the others. And I understand um, other schools are, have ex expanded, but there was mitigation put in place in relation to Springfield. So the similar things need to be agreed prior to a spade being put into the ground on the design of these classrooms, of which I don't have an issue, but it's not good enough to have just a condition that we'll try and do what we can. We need to agree on a local neighbourhood basis with the school. We've got a meeting organised on Monday to talk to the schools, with the staff, to look at these sort of things. But the, the measures that are required as a result of this application need to be agreed formally, under condition if necessary, before work starts. Unfortunately, the school have already started by moving the, the power cable supply and things, but what we can't afford to happen is for the school to be built and then measures not put in place to mitigate the expansion of these, this school, although even though it's on a restricted site, the residents and the safety, the safety and the and amenity of the residents and the safety of the pupils should be a priority. So that condition in relation to mitigating factors certainly needs to be seriously strengthened. Thank you, Chair. He's glad to come back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, in terms of the condition, we've got to focus it on the development before us. Of course, you'll have much greater knowledge than me about the problems in the area. I mean, I went, went to the school today, and I think one of the benefits that it does have with its neighbouring Springfield Primary is it, it staggers the end of day, end of school finish time, and there were, there were lots of children. I mean, I must admit, there were lots of children walking from West Park, and when it, it got to about 25 past three, you could see this, the, the, the primary school children emerging, and there was a bit of regulation there. But I think what we do need to do is, is potentially look at that condition and agree it with the chair before any decision is dispatched. But also, I think there's got to be a wider council discussion about Church Street opportunities and looking at the wider opportunities for the three schools. Because as I left, excuse me, as I left today onto Church Street, St. Werberg's were, were turning out. And you can see there was more of an issue on Church Street than there was on West Road, if I'm totally honest, but that was only today and that's a, a nice sunny day when children were, well nearly 500 of them were walking. So, yeah, so I think probably we extend the condition in consultation with the chair and vice and then look at a much better solution for that locality and the three schools as a whole. Yeah, it, it just struck me that the solution is our, in our own hands. Yeah. 
this application is by the city council. It is not by the academy. Um, you know, the, the sixth form is, is, is separate from that. So it, it's the education department that is, is doing this. So I would expect no appeal against our own decision. We also own that former turning circle. Uh, it, it is maintained by parks and they have several people using it. But what that turning circle is used for is determined by this city council. Um, I find the fact that somebody has made a decision to close those gates um, appalling, quite honestly, unless they have a very good reason for, for doing it, because that is just causing a problem for the whole neighbourhood, and I would have thought you go into consultation with the neighbours before you take that sort of decision, unless it is particularly an overriding safeguarding issue, um, which nobody seems to be very convinced that it is. Anyway, Councillor Harwood. Well, you, you beg, don't know exactly what I was going to ask, actually, uh, unfortunately, because the situation is, it's our application, and I just wondered where it would go if this committee turned it down, and, I, and you've given the answer, really, so thanks for that. It's okay, I know what you're going to say, but... Uh... You also worked out, Chair, that, that 20 cycle parking places implies that we've only got 5% of the, the new pupils and the new staff cycling. And that isn't actually very ambitious. That's what you were going to say, wasn't it, Chair? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, yeah, we've got, we've got 150 additional school places, I understand, and we've got eight additional staff, which is effectively 160, which is a pretty low cycling rate for 20 additional places. And I think this is it's symptomatic of where we are with problems in schools across the city. That it's not only staff who are, are driving, it's the children who are being driven to school. And we've got a figure here of 72% of respondents travel to school either on foot, by bicycle, or by public transport, and walking presumably a little bit at the end. Well, that leaves three, you know, a quarter of them, we're talking about three, 400 kids who are coming by car and probably being collected by car. And if you put it that way around, you can see why we've got a problem, and with two additional schools nearby. There is no mention in the conditions about the travel plan. We heard reference to the travel plan, but I think we need to do something really positive there, as you've said, Chair. And we need to get involved, um, our own resource of Cycle Derby, to see what can be done. Yes, the comment is that it's, cycling is too dangerous, and that's where you need to say, right, Maybe we don't need to be facilitating cars coming around and coming down um, Park Road and, and um, West Road. Perhaps we should be saying they should be pedestrian only and the drop-off points should be further away and people can walk. Unless you're a disabled person, you can walk a bit further. And we need to be a bit more um, decisive about what we expect. And that there's good research that shows that children who have had a bit of exercise on their way to school, it should be more than 200 yards, but you know, if you've got to walk 200 yards, maybe some people won't get in the car in the first place. It means that they learn better when they get there. And because they're learning better, they get better outcomes, it improves the performance of the school. We need to be stronger on this for the sake of our children and not just the sake of the residents. And so um, a condition there on travel planning and I would like to see if we can get some sort of combined travel planning because there will be children who have come to one of the other schools um, within the same family and they'll be picking up from St. Weirbergs and West Park or from um, whichever combination of schools. And we need to be working together in that area a bit more proactively than we are at present. And I think there needs to be a condition along those lines somehow. Mr Woodhead. Yeah, I agree a travel plan condition should be on there and also an informative to promote that discussion between the schools so that there's a conversation about that travel planning element between the three schools and um, I think, yes, that's a sensible solution, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've been asked to clarify whether this is an application by the City Council, Education Department, Education Authority or an academy. And my impression is it was the Education Authority but can anybody clarify that? It's us. It, it, it's us. It's, um, <laughs> it, it's the education department yes. that is, yeah. has actually put in this application. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hassel. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick one, really. I don't think anyone here is against the principle of expanding the school. I think we all need and agree that we need uh, adequate spaces for our children to learn. Um, it's a question, really. Is there any scope for this application be, to be deferred until such a plan is arranged and organised and one that we can look at and vote on? Thank you. I would suggest there's a better way, and, and that is to grant it with a condition, but a very tough condition. Uh, and I would suggest, um, Councillor Poulter's words, uh, a proper raft of uh, conditions, um, a strengthened travel plan, uh, which really means what it says. And I would have thought, as a city council, we could, we could do that. Um, technically, that would be uh, agreed by me and the vice chairman, uh, and drawn up by the officers, but obviously I would uh, consult ward councillors to do that, rather than hold up the, um, <coughs> the granting of that, but we would make that a very firm condition. Uh, is that what you were going to say? Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I, I'd like to say to Taris, quite uh, taken in by one of the objections, which said that uh, it could be uh, that a new secondary school could be built in Oakwood, my ward. Well, we, we cried out for that uh, a long time ago and it didn't materialise. Anyway, um, what I want to say is that we had an assurance from the Iceways officer, who, and it states on page 33 that um, a review would be taking place regarding traffic, etc. And I'm quite happy at that, and I go along with your recommendations because I think it's the only way to go. It, uh, the school needs to be extended and we have really no other choice but to put in that the traffic situation is looked at first. Anybody want to say anything new on, on the application that hasn't been covered? I, I take it everybody's in favour of it happening, uh, but with a very strong replacement condition 4, uh, which doesn't even read grammatically actually, but, um, but to strengthen that... Um, to address the concerns of the ward councillors and the objectors. Is, is, can I have a show of hands in, in favour of that? Thank you. Unanimous. Uh, that is unanimous, yes. Um, members of the public are concerned. It is the uh, rough Hina uh, one at Derby Road, Chelliston. Beg your pardon before Rafina. Yeah, um, shall we take that one? Uh, who's Stephen Bate? Mr. Bate, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. This is an application, it's a, a retrospective application uh, for the retention of a timber garden pergola, 3.3 metres high, with a dual pitch tiled roof, uh, which matches the height and materials of the adjoining garage. You can see from the, uh, the slides, the, uh, the pergola is located alongside uh, the boundary fence. Um, the pergola there shown in blue, the, uh, the garage, the existing garage is to the right of that and there's an additional garden structure to the left um, further towards the end of the garden. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, that's, that shows the pergola under construction. You'll see it's, it's of a high quality um, and the the pitch and the height of it uh, extend the gar from the garage, so it's, it's the same sort of style um, and height as, as the garage. These are views <coughs> taken from the, the neighbour's garden, um, and I'll, I'll come to that relationship in a moment, but there you can see how the, the pergola with the, the sort of shiny tile finish um, extends beyond the, the end of the, of the garage. Um, the timber fencing is a new structure, but that, that doesn't require planning permission. Uh, the application has been referred to, um, to committee by Councillor McChrystal uh, and also concerns have been raised by Councillor Grimadell. Um, there's been one objection from the adjoining neighbour at number 83 uh, and that's primarily concerned at the overbearing nature of the pergola, um, although <coughs> other issues have been raised by that neighbour regarding encroachment um, and land ownership, but these, uh, as members are aware, are, are not planning considerations. The applicant has submitted a letter in support of the application, which has been received fairly late, but that has been circulated to members. Um, and for, for members' benefit, I'll, I'll just go through some of the points there uh, and what the, the applicant's saying. Uh, they state the pergola is a, 
a high quality manufacturer built and installed by qualified tradesmen um, and they consider it aesthetically pleasing. It's to serve as an undercover weather protection facility and essentially it's just a, a roof with no side walls. Um, the roof is an extension to an exactly the same width as the existing garage, as I previously mentioned. Uh, they consider that the pergola does not impede the neighbor's light or view. Uh, they also allege that uh, the work was done um, and was pre-authorized by the neighbor, uh, but obviously I've got no evidence to, to corroborate that. Um, and they also mentioned that it's only after the work was finished that the neighbor uh, has made objections. Um, so that's, that's the view from the applicant um, who uh, is a resident in Singapore so uh, will not be able to speak tonight. Um, so in planning terms, the pergola is a typical garden structure and it's therefore acceptable in principle. It is well constructed of quality materials uh, and officers believe that its design and appearance are visually acceptable. The only contentious issue being the impact on the neighbor. The pergola is on the north side of the neighbour, so there's no loss of light. And although it adjoins the site boundary, the roof slopes away, which mitigates any visual intrusion. It is of a similar height to the existing garage, so it has a minimal overbearing presence. Um, and it's accepted that the neighbour has some loss of outlook, but overall, officers believe that it's not considered that the impact is so overriding to justify refusal. Similarly, um, should members refuse the application, then they would need to look at potential enforcement action, which officers believe uh, would not be expedient. Uh, the recommendation is to grant permission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have a speaker, uh, Mr. Doyle. Do Thank you, like you Chair. Uh, I'm just reading this on behalf of my parents who are sitting in the gallery up there, and this is, this is what he'd like to say. Uh, the owner of 85 Derby Road, Chelliston, uh, which was Mrs. Williams, I first approached my wife and I last November 2017. Uh, she asked if I would agree to the changes on my boundary line, this being the demolition of the hedge and cut the tree by half, also to extend the building in keeping with the height. I went on holiday only to return to see all of the tree had been removed and instead of a lean-to roof as promised, the height but had been extended and the apex roof was fitted. I emailed Mrs Williams explaining my concerns. She repeatedly said, it's my land and I've authorized planning from the planning department, which later proved false. I then had to accept the planning department's ruling. The fence erected was uh, not very private and not the promised six foot as agreed by myself. I then became suspicious because now she seemed to break our original verbal agreement. I phoned her builders uh, for a drawing of her intentions, but she would not talk to me. Mrs. Williams accused me of, of harassment to them and her tenants and the builders. In general, all untrue. The tenants have been very friendly throughout, visiting my driveway, uh, and their driveway was inaccessible. I, I allowed the cars to be parked on my drive, got on well with the builder, etc. I have paid £300 to a qualified surveyor uh, to ascertain the width of my garden, last registered 1996. The width shows 25 and a half feet and the present shows 24 foot 8 inches, which the building extension is encroaching on my land. I realise this is a civil matter and it's been fought by myself. The owner then told me of the pergola which she intended to build. I told her that it was not acceptable. But before the, the build began, she reminded me that she had authorization by the planning department, which was later untrue. I was suspicious and again contacted, contacted the planning department. All knowledge of the ensuing build, both the brick extension and the pergola, was in fact unauthorized. In conclusion, the main points are, the owner, maintained, uh, the owner ma manipulated myself and my wife at the outset. No drawings or plans were ever given to us or never told about any extensions. The height and length of the brick, uh, the brick and the pergola had broken the, the planning rules. And instead of the three months promised, it took over nine months to com complete, causing great stress to myself and my wife. And obviously, um, is, uh, my, my father's actually taking medication to relieve the stress. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to come back on anything, Mr. Bates? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, 
uh, I acknowledge a lot of the comments that have been made by, uh, by the neighbour and as he, he rightly points out, many of those are civil issues concerning the, the boundary and land ownership and things that the, the applicant has promised that would happen, which clearly haven't happened. Unfortunately, we're here to make a decision regarding the planning merits of the, of the pergola, which, in our opinion, is acceptable. Thank you, Chair. Councillor McChrystal, you asked for it to be brought to committee. Um, I'll give you the first say. Thank you, Chair. So, um, yeah, so um, I brought this to committee. It's, a, it's in Chelliston Ward, obviously, Chelliston Ward Councillor. Uh, Mr. Dorr contacted me initially um, about the, uh, the land grab that does seem to have been proven, though I understand that's not a matter for um, this evening, the land grab of the new fence that was constructed um, bordering the, the, the two properties. Um, I noticed the pergola and couldn't believe it was there. To, to, I was quite surprised actually, so I checked the planning portal and realised no planning had actually been applied for. Um, the um, pergola is, is actually tied in to the, um, the, the current property. To say it's a, a typical um, garden structure, I, I completely disagree. It's, a, it's an extension. The only thing it hasn't got at the moment is walls. And, I appreciate what we're talking about is retrospective plan permission. Here to say in a few minutes' time, not talk about retrospective plan permission to put some walls on as well that have already been erected. Um, I've sat and stood in Mr. Dawes' garden, and in my opinion, this is it's 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 absurd. It's it's an ugly, um, ugly structure. I appreciate the workmanship may be fantastic, but it's it's wholly unacceptable. Would I want that in the garden next to me? Absolutely not. And I can understand Mr. Dawes' concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, any views? Councillor Kerr. S Sorry. I can't, I know I, I can't, you, could, you could use it for storing bicycles, I suppose, but not that many. And, you know, it must be a house in very many occupations to need a bicycle rack that size. No, um, I was going to ask two things. One is what's happening about drainage off the roof. Is that going to be an issue? And secondly, is there a difference in land levels between the properties? So is the, does it appear to be higher from the neighbour's side than from this side. Perhaps I would have um, thought drainage comes under building regulations, does it not? But perhaps yeah, you can tell I, us about whether I the think there's chairman, I think there's a, a gutter which which runs along the side of the garage, so that would, would take the, the water away from that neighbour. It, it, the, the the roof doesn't overhang the boundary, so there shouldn't be any discharge over the boundary. Um, <coughs> well that it's not a planning matter. Yeah. Um, what was the second point? Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, the levels. No, I, th I think it's generally uh, level across the sites. I can't recall there being a very significant difference between the, uh, the levels on the two sides. I mean, differences of opinion between neighbours are best settled between neighbours. If necessary, they can escalate to go to court. What they must not do is take the planning committee's consideration because it's nothing to do with us. Um, the, the boundary and encroachment and so on are civil matters, nothing to do with planning. Our consideration must be whether or not that is an acceptable structure in the back garden. If we said no, there'd be an awful lot of structures all over Derby that would be illegal. So anybody want to speak on this, Councillor Harwood? Thank you, Chair. I have a tendency to say, here we go again. Another application that's not got planning permission. It staggers me when Mr and Mrs Williams say in their letter that it's installed by a qualified tradesman working for a long-standing and reputable <coughs> building company. Surely they should know, if they have any standard, that they need planning permission. And they're going to say it is aesthetically pleasing from all angles. Well. Having seen it, I don't think it is. Um, I think it's ugly. Uh, I can understand that. I've certainly wouldn't like it in my garden next door garden, to me. Uh, and in view of what has been said and proved that there has been certain things done which are against the law in some respect, and yes, I know that we can't deal with that. It has to be through the law. The fact is this, that it's not been very well uh, dealt with, as far as I'm concerned, in view of the fact I can remember one of these things being happening at other street, uh, I would say he's going to get his first job as far as I'm concerned, the enforcement officer, because I think it should come down. 
Councillor Carr. Very quickly, Chair. I mean, I, I know, as you've said, and uh, the officer has said that the sort of infringement is a civil issue. Uh, but I, I, I just wonder if we can, for future applications, I mean, we'll sit here and debate something that may get overturned in, in a court simply because one neighbour has pinched a bit of land of the other. I, I wonder if we can put that into, you know, some sort of rule that anything that comes before us must be clear of, of uh, you know, having sort of somebody saying uh, fr from civil litigation. Because it, it's, it's not, it doesn't make much sense for, you know, 11, 12 councillors here to debate something which might get overturned because of civil action. I'm going to ask Mr. Teasdale, a legal advisor, to give us well, advice. <laughs> well, I think the answer is no. I mean, sort of, <laughs> I think as simple as that. I mean, it's not something as you've been told is relevant, and I think you fully know that private matters are not relevant in terms of the planning system, and it's, it's not something that you could put into policy or anything like that. Sir Evans. Thank you, Chair. I feel uh, planning permission, retrospectively, should only be granted in extreme circumstances. Uh, I'm sorry, that's my opinion. I don't yeah. think it's right how people should be allowed to build things and then seek planning afterwards. It, it ought, we, ought, we don't want to set a precedence here where we, people can think, well, we'll build it and we'll sort the planning out afterwards. It needs to be in the forefront of the mind. And, and any building and construction company that's worth the salt would have known that and would have advised them to do that, wouldn't they? Thank you. I think if you try and ring the planning department, you're lucky if you get an answer. If, if you say, I'm going to build a pergola um, that, that just extends my garage, they'll say, well, how big and, you know, all this palaver. I, I, I'm just putting a counter, counter point of view. The way it works all across this country is that if somebody builds something that needs planning permission they haven't applied for, the simplest solution is to invite them to pl apply for planning permission, unless, of course, it's dangerous, which is a different matter. Uh, they then apply for permission, and it goes through the system as if it wasn't there. And if we refuse it, it has to come down and subject to enforcement. So that, that's the situation we've got. But um, I'm still going to ask Mr. Teasdale to, to give us the law on the matter, because that's, I'm a layman on this matter. No, I think you've summed it up, Chair, quite well. I think, you know, I think I'm very concerned that members sort of um, trying to sort of uh, use the planning system to penalise people because they haven't sort of submitted an application. You, you need to concentrate on whether the application, on its merit, in terms of planning, is acceptable. Uh, in terms of appearance and scale, etc. Um, I think one advantage, having said that, of, of um, a, a retrospective application is that if it's in place, you can actually judge for your own. So it, it, it's easier to judge. So there is, a, there is a benefit there. There is a risk, obviously, for anybody who does that uh, in terms of enforcement um, and it's also sort of in terms of, as I've said in the past, where people build houses without planning permission or, or, <laughs> or, or, or going through the right, right process. If they come to sell them in future, it causes them great difficulty. So, so, so sort of retrospective planning and application, you need to tr deal with it as if it was, and, and not to try to sort of say, well, this person is in the wrong there before we should take that into account. That should not be taken as a consideration. That was my understanding, certainly. Well, the recommendation then is to grant permission with conditions. Those in favour? Okay, those, those against? One, two, three. Three. Uh, I just wondered whether an advisory note um, that if you plant foliage to grow over a structure, it can soften it might be helpful? Purely as an advisory note, maybe. Um, I, think, I don't think you can make plants grow. Uh, this, <laughs> this is uh, by condition, uh, certainly. This is on the north side. It doesn't, it, it, you know, it doesn't obstruct anything. Okay, so permission is granted with conditions as printed. Thank you. That takes us on then to Rafina Farm. Um, and who's going to do this one? It's uh, Laura, Laura Neal. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I've just got one update for you. Um, we did invite Highways England um, to attend this evening's committee, um, but they weren't able to. But they have sent the following statement. Highways England repeatedly requested additional information, most recently in their response of the 26th of January 2018. To date, there has been no response from the developer, and as such, we do not have sufficient information to determine whether the application is acceptable. And now I'd like to move to the main report. Some members may be familiar with this site, a site visit being carried out on the 3rd of February 2016. Outline planning permission, with all matters reserved except access, is sought to redevelop this site to accommodate up to 80 dwelling houses, a restaurant and coffee shop with drive through facilities, along with the demolition of outbuildings and the remodelling of the junction of the A516 and A38 on and off slips. An amendment to the Red Edge has been submitted during the life of the application and additional information has been submitted in respect of highways, noise, air quality and heritage matters. The residential and commercial elements of this application are in outline format with the access and remodelling of the junction in detail. In summary, the application seeks to stop up the current onslip to the A38 and integrate this section of highway into the application site and as an estate road pushing the proposed on-slip northward. The current off-slip will remain relatively unaltered except to the point of access to the application site where a new roundabout comprising of four arms will be provided. The site itself is sandwiched between the on and off-slips of the A516 and A38 at the junction with the Royal Derby Hospital roundabout. The site accommodates the Ruffina Farm farmhouse, which is a locally listed building, and scrubland. The site itself with the land to the north is designated as Green Wedge, as defined in the adopted Derby City Local Plan Part 1, and provides a green buffer between Mackworth and Mickleover. The introduction of development in this location, in this form, along with the remodelling of the junction, has created concern from local and surrounding residents, concerns which are echoed by consultees. The overall principle of this development is not considered to be acceptable and is contrary to the MPPF and the newly adopted Part 1 local plan. Notwithstanding this fact, the proposal is also not acceptable in its current form in respect of highway, retail policy, residential amenity, heritage and ecological terms and is therefore recommended for refusal and the six reasons for refusal are set out on page 106 of your report. The issues are fully presented in the report and I intend to provide an overview of these. The principle of development. The application is located in the Green Wedge as designated in the adopted local plan and therefore policy CP18 is relevant in the determination of this application. Green Wedges play an essential role in separating and defining the character of the area, Mackworth and Mickleover in this instance. Development in green wedges has the potential to erode the function of the green wedge and therefore careful consideration must be given to the type of development permitted in these locations. Policy CP18 clearly outlines the type of developments that are appropriate to green wedge locations as set out on pages 91 and 92 of your reports. The proposed development being a mixed use residential and commercial development not being with any of those categories, <coughs> categories is a clear conflict with policy CP18 part A and would undermine the role and function of the green wedge. The removal of the site from the green wedge and the prospect of developing this site was considered in the preparation of the Derby City Local Plan part 1 where this site was considered as an omission site during the examination process. The inspector was satisfied with the council's housing land supply position and saw no compelling reason to remove this site from the Green Wedge, concluding in his report that the site would require the realignment of off-slip of slip roads onto the A38 and, the, and in, there is insufficient information as to whether this will be feasible or viable, and this remains the case. It is important to note that the council can demonstrate a robust five-year housing land supply following the adoption of the local plan part one and therefore local plan policies referred to can carry full weight in the decision making process. In addition to the green wedge issue, the applicant has failed to justify the introduction of food and drink uses in this location. Such uses are considered to be main retail centre uses and therefore subject to a sequential test as required in the MPPF and policies CP12 and CP13. Therefore, the information submitted in this regard is considered to be inadequate. 
In summary, there are in principle objections to the scheme and as such, the impact of the proposal on the green wedge and out of centre proposals are considered to weigh heavily against the development as it directly conflicts with local and national planning policy as set out in reasons one and three of your report. In respect of highways, Notwithstanding the in principle objections to the scheme, there are also concerns regarding impact on, public, on the public highway. As discussed, the application seeks to realign the onslip of the A38 in order to facilitate the development. By doing so, the existing onslip will be left redundant. The applicant has failed to engage with Highways England to determine what would be the outcome of the redundant onslip, a matter that Highways England, within their consultation responses, has raised as an area of concern. The most crucial issue in respect of highways is that the application has failed to demonstrate that a safe and suitable access can be provided. Whilst the applicant has submitted a transport assessment with a number of updates, colleagues from Highways England, Transport Planning and Highways Development Control retain their objections due to a lack of information being provided and a lack of certainty that the proposal would not have a detrimental impact on the function and capacity of the highway network. Furthermore, concerns remain that the modelling provided in the transport assessments reflects the proposed uses, the current traffic flows on the network and the way in which the road network operates, particularly in reference to the hospital roundabout. As a result, we cannot be certain that the introduction of the new roundabout will not result in queues back along the A38 off-slip and back into the hospital roundabout. As already discussed, there is also uncertainty that proposed highway works are deliverable, as identified in the detailed consultation response from Highways England. In summary, the application has failed to provide sufficient information to demonstrate that the pro proposals would provide a safe and suitable access, that the improvements would cost-effectively mitigate the impact of the development and are deliverable. The proposal is therefore contrary to national and local planning policy, as detailed within reason for, reason for refusal number two. In respect, of high, uh, in respect of residential amenity, whilst this application is an outline format, if permission were to be granted, we will be agreeing to the principle of residential development in this location. Through the life of the application, further details have been submitted in respect of noise and air quality the content of which has been agreed with colleagues in environmental health and who have raised no objection. And whilst acoustic mitigation has been provided in the form of a 4.5 metre high barrier and a 20 metre buffer for air quality, I still remain concerned about the appropriateness of residential development in this area. In fact, I note comments of environmental health colleagues who acknowledge that the proposed residential dwellings that are positioned such that they benefit from the full protection of the acoustic barrier are within acceptable noise levels. The submitted noise report addendum does suggest that this will not be the case for all dwellings and that some residents will need to keep their windows closed at all times. Notwithstanding concerns in respect of noise and air quality, the proposed development provides limited open space, poor connectivity and access by foot to local amenities, raising the question of whether this site is in a sustainable location. And for these reasons, the proposal is contrary to local and national policy, as set out in Reason Refusal 4. Ecology. The full comments of Derbyshire Wildlife Trust are set out on pages 83 to 85 of your report. Whilst the application was accompanied by a Habitat and Protected Species report and a Phase 2 bat survey along with the TOPO and Habitats plan, additional information remains outstanding in respect of protected species, particularly bats which are present on site. The application, applicant has failed to provide an updated protected species survey and proposed mitigation without which we cannot assess the potential impact on protected species and satisfy our legal requirements of the Habitat regulations. The proposal is therefore contrary to local and national policies as set out in reason for refusal number five. Heritage. Additional information has been submitted during the life of the application in respect of the locally listed Ruffina farmhouse. However, it remains unclear as to what impact the alignment of the proposed onslip with associated embankment structures, air quality and noise mitigation structures will have on the setting of the non-designated heritage asset. Therefore, the proposal is contrary to local and national planning policy as set out in Reason Refusal number six. The application itself has attracted six, ten letters of objection which are set out in your report. 
the applicant and agent have expressed concerns with regards to with regards to the time taken to progress this application. The reason being the local planning authority has sought to work proactively with the applicant to try and address these reasons for refusal and the issues. That being said, the application still fails to demonstrate that proposed development is acceptable in principle in respect of its impact on the public highway, its impact on heritage assets and ecology and in respect of residential amenity. Furthermore, the limited benefits arriving for the, from the scheme are not considered to outweigh the negative impacts. And for these reasons, the application is recommended for refusal. The scheme is the wrong development in the wrong location at the wrong time, and there are harmful impacts, and these are expanded upon in your report and are summarised in the six reasons for refusal. Colleagues are also on hand to answer any further questions, including Carl from Environmental Health, Paul from Highways, Nikki from Policy, and Rosie from Section 106 team. The applicant, the, the agent for the application, Mr. Steve Sims, is here to address committee along with Mr. Froggart, who speaks in objection. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Laura. That was a very long and very informative uh, and valuable report. Uh, and I certainly appreciate that in addition to all the pages we've already read. read. Um, <coughs> as befits a, a, a major application of this size. Uh, so the first speaker on behalf of the applicant is Mr. Sims. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, uh, Chair, members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on our client's application. Um, as, as you'll know, this application was submitted nearly three years ago. Um, it's an outline application, the only detailed matter being access, as the site is currently surrounded and effectively cut off by slip roads. The report before you is 48 pages long and six reasons for refusal are proposed. However, the, the key issues are whether this piece of green wedge is of sufficient value to outweigh the benefits the development would bring in terms of housing, infrastructure and jobs, and whether the proposed access is acceptable. Because the application was submitted some time ago, many of you will not have had the opportunity to visit the site. Um, and this is unfortunate, as this is essential to appreciating how isolated it is, both visually um, and in terms of access. Indeed, there were some residents at the consultation event that we ran um, who couldn't visualise where the site, site was. Um, in terms of the extent to which it separates Micklover from Mackworth, the site cannot be seen and is not perceived by people on surrounding roads or countryside. Its development would result in a remaining separation at the narrowest point of 700 metres, and this is significantly more than the 400 metres left by some of the core strategy allocations. There's a significant amount of highways information in the report, but the key concern is that too many hospital staff will pass through the existing gyratory travel via our new roundabout and then turn right into the car park, thereby causing traffic from the A38 to queue at our new roundabout. We do not consider this realistic. Hospital staff arriving via the gyratory already have a means of access to their car park, and very few will make what would be for them a detour via the new roundabout. In fact, the NHS Trust are quite clear that they need the access to provide resilience and to prevent situations in which their staff cannot access or leave their car parks at all. This is the only practical way to provide such an access. It also provides much needed housing, jobs and infrastructure capacity, including better access to adjoining city council land. It would reduce pollution to existing properties by relocating the slip road away from them and will of course ensure that all new properties meet modern standards. It would also remo remove the existing substandard access to the farm from the slip roads which is dangerous both for, the for its occupiers and for the road users. We've demonstrated that the remainder of the issues raised can be dealt with more than adequately at the reserve matter stage and would urge you to consider the balance between what is unused and indeed unusable at present land that few people know exists and the jobs housing and infrastructure that the development would provide. There's much more to this than I can cover in three minutes, but if refused, we intend to resubmit, if only to allow members to consider the issues further and visit the site. Thank you. And uh, on behalf of the objectors, Mr. Froggart. Thank you, Chair. I have objected to this development, and I'm pleased to see that your officers have recommended that it be refused. I hope that the Planning Commission Committee will agree with the officers in this case. Uh, 
The developer proposes a fast food outlet, which the city is not short of, and around 80 homes. The city needs affordable homes, but none are proposed. Expensive houses are already catered for elsewhere by the local plan. I agree with your officers that this proposal is not sufficiently exceptional to allow to be built in the green wedge. The far end of the wedge has been narrowed by building round Micklover by Hackwood Farm and Radbourne Lane developments. This would block off the city end and, and the fact that it is inaccessible means that it's accessible for things that fly rather than the people who go by land. But my particular interest is transport. The site was once proposed as a park and ride. I think it's still in the local plan as that. So whatever the outcome of the current air quality consultation, there's still a need to reduce traffic into the city. Ground level parking isn't incompatible with Green Wedge. Houses and cafes are. Anyone who visits the Hospital Island in the morning peak will know that traffic from the Ring Road Junction blocks back onto it. The Ring Road Junction is already overloaded, and that will get worse when all the new houses in Micklover are completed. Traffic also stops to let ambulances in and out of the hospital. The developers haven't allowed for either of these in their modelling, and so have overestimated the capacity for traffic to move around the hospital island. Their comments, I think, some sort can be summarised as, the traffic's bad, we won't make it much worse. I don't want to make it any worse. Not mentioned in the officer's report is the timing of when this may be built. Highways England are currently planning to build their A38 junction scheme between 2021 and 2024. This will cause major disruption at those junctions. The developer proposes to remodel the nearest alternative to the three junctions. Surely Youth City can't allow this to happen at the same time. I also doubt the viability of the commercial development. The A38 slip roads are one way on and off. You can't pull off the A38, call in and buy some food and pull back on again. You can do that at Little Eaton, Mark Eaton, Toyota Island and the Wipass Island. And if you come off the A38, there's lots of alternatives within a 10 minutes drive, particularly in Little Over. Stop you there, Mr. Yes, Frogger. That was Fascinated a, I've got them. one more sentence, so that's near enough. Thank you. Yep, I'll just come back on the green wedge point that Mr. Sims raised. Um, obviously, we've got a really newly adopted plan. It's only been um, adopted within the last 18 months. So the inspector considered the green wedge during that time and he didn't choose to release it for housing. We have got a robust five-year supply. Obviously, he has got the opportunity with his client to come forward while we do the part two plan um, to put that site forward. Obviously, Nikki's here for further details, should she wish to come forward. <laughs> that, and I'll divert the highways points to Mr. Chamberlain. There were a number of highway issues there. Um, Paul, do you want to speak at this point or answer questions later? Okay. Sorry. We also have officers to deal with Section 106 issues and for uh, environmental health, um, noise and pollution issues, should you have any questions on those um, aspects. So, do, do you want to come in? No. no right. Um, Members of the committee, Councillor Harwood first then. Yeah, in view of what's been said, uh, particularly by Mr Sims, uh, I'd like to propose that the application is adjourned and the committee have a site visit. Uh, you did have, we did have a site visit, albeit some time ago. Um, we did also have this in a list of major uh, uh, um, applications which, for which we could have site visits and nobody proposed it at that time. That said, that is a proposal. Does anybody second that? Sorry, Councillor Harwood, nobody has seconded. Second. All right. All right. I, I would point out that there are very strong reasons to refuse this at this point. Um, making a site visit 
won't change any of those reasons. Um, all right, I'm going to put it to the vote that we, uh, it's been proposed and seconded that we, have, we defer the application, this huge application that we defer that uh, for a site visit. Those in favor? One, two. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. 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 That proposal is, is um, overturned, I'm afraid, and it, it's lost. So can we re return to the debate on the uh, issues raised? Councillor Kerr. This, um, this is in the very edge of Little Over Ward. So when the application came in, there was great interest. And I think it's actually a very creative um, application. Because the, I remember when the, the farm itself was up for sale, probably about, oh, well, at one time, about, probably about 20, 25 years ago. And I thought, wow, how on earth are you going to get on and off that site? Because access to it is really difficult, and it seemed to be a pretty bit of dead land. Since then, it's been used for dumping on, um, because it was used as a sort of spoil heap when they were building the Royal Derby Hospital. And I don't know if that's been cleared up or not, but it was quite, um, it's got some quite interesting environmental um, attributes, let's say. So I'm not quite sure how much value it has for wildlife, but it's, it's, it was fairly abandoned, which might be quite good for some elements of wildlife. Um, it also, as was mentioned, moves the slip road away from the existing housing, and it's quite noisy down there, and there wasn't, when, the, when that road was built, there wasn't the same sort of expectations for, for noise attenuation or concern about air quality. So moving, moving the roads a bit further from quite a lot of those houses would be uh, an asset. Though building more houses adjacent to the replacement road or close to the replacement road doesn't seem to be a particularly good solution. And as it stands, it would be really quite isolated from the rest of the, the residential network. Um, so I think it's really interesting, but I think there are really, really strong reasons for not doing it. In fact, they, they almost feel that they're overly strong reasons for not doing it. Um, and we might, at some point in the future, regret that if in five, ten years' time we are short of housing land and we want to review this. So in, in Laura's final words, saying that at this time it's not appropriate, um, I, I will bear hope on that one. Um, I think she's put a very good case forward for, for not allowing this at the moment. We may in 10 years' time be short of housing land, but I don't believe in, even in 10 years' time this committee would condemn people to live in houses where they can't open the windows at any time of the day because of the pollution. Any other members of the committee? Councillor Rawson. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think my view is I'm, I wouldn't actually necessarily be against the principle of development on this site um, outright um, but there are an awful lot of um, questions uh, question marks and um, issues um, that seem to be outstanding um, and not uh, not having been resolved at this point um, I think um, in terms of the, the green wedge and um, the points have been made about um, future housing allocation are very pertinent because um, we will be required to review the local plan and probably in not too distant uh, uh, future um, and there will be other part of a pieces of green wedge around the city that will be coming under pressure um, for for housing development so there is a legitimate um, question uh, for committee to to weigh up around the um, the value of this particular piece of green wedge uh, which is um, very remote and inaccessible to local people when compared to uh, another green wedge elsewhere in the city um, having said that, um, the lack of engagement with Highways England is uh, concerning. Um, the isolated nature of the, um, the development and the impact that that would have on the local road network because people would have to travel a fair distance to use um, local amenities unless uh, we're saying that the we're talking about a district centre or at least some sort of local shopping provision on there. Um, the, 
the, the costs of shifting a, a major dual carriageway must be uh, extremely high and uh, um, I can't really get my head around how that might be um, commercially viable to, um, to make the costs of the development stack up when you're taking into account the, the costs of sh shifting a dual carriageway um, that, um, that distance. That's probably not, not for us to consider, but um, I'm sure the, the applicant will have done. Um, we are meeting our five-year supply of land at, at, at present, um, and um, we have, as officers have said, um, uh, only fairly recently allocated land in the local plan. So the, there are a lot of issues with this particular site. Um, I think it's one that we may wish to consider in the future when there's pressure on other bits of green wedge um, around the city. Um, but um, personally, I just think there are too many, uh, too many questions and un unanswered um, questions at this moment in time. Thank you. Any members of the committee want to speak in favour of the application? In which case, Councillor Harwood. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the officers for their very comprehensive report. It, it took some reading, but it was well worth it. Uh, Chair, how pleasing we are, this committee, I'm sure, that we have last got a recommendation for refusal to accommodate a green wedge. You know, over the years I've been on this committee, which is quite a long time, as you know, we've often talked about green wedges, particularly between Oakwood and Spondon and what have you. So it's pleasing that we've got a recommendation here, not just for a green wedge, but that is part of the refusal, and it's very pleasing as far as I'm concerned. In like, yeah, we have defended appeals on green wedge sites very recently, Councillor Harwood. Spondon Chadderston Green Wedge, yeah. North Avenue. So we have rolled back components of Green Wedge as part of the plan process, but it's been a balanced element of peripheral growth and Green Wedge rollback. But it, they've all been very carefully looked at and defended in this chamber in particular. I think by the time the 10 years people have referred to, I'll actually be occupying my own <laughs> six foot of Green Wedge. <laughs> at, um, we have a recommended. <laughs> We have a recommendation before us to refuse planning permission with a list of cogent reasons. Uh, those in favour of that refusal? That is again unanimous. Thank you for that. Permission is refused for the reasons set out. Which leaves us just one more, I believe. It's a micro pub at Blenheim Drive. Which is Blenheim Drive and a, a micro pub. Um, okay. Who's going to speak on this? Stephen Bate. Mr. Bate, you must be an expert on micropubs. <laughs> if only, Chairman, <laughs> if only. Um, this is a proposed change of use from the uh, existing, well, former beauty salon, it's, it's closed recently, called Simply Gorgeous, um, to a micropub. Um, the application shows no external alterations proposed. Um, as I mentioned, the former use uh, was as a beauty salon with a training facility at first floor and there's a small parking area on the forecourt. There has been a recent planning permission to change the use of the first floor to a flat, and the current proposal is to change the ground floor to a micro pub, uh, and it's recently been granted a premises license. The opening hours are from, proposed to be from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m., uh, with minimal deliveries, and the applicant is aiming, and in his words, for a quiet, relaxing atmosphere. The site is located within the Alistair Neighbourhood Centre. Um, the Co-op Supermarket is immediately to the west and the Woodlands Chapel um, to the east on the front. There are residential bungalows in Woodlands Road and Laburnum Crescent to the rear. There have been no representations received from any neighbours or third parties uh, and the matter has been referred to committee by Councillor Hassel. In terms of consultations, our highways uh, consider that the location is within a local centre, therefore within walking distance of a large population and with good public transport links, and in that respect is acceptable and no objections were raised. There have been no adverse comments raised by either Environmental Health, by Derbyshire Fire and Rescue or by the police. In planning policy terms, the site is located within the neighbourhood centre. 
the proposal is considered not to adversely impact on the viability of the centre and therefore would be in accordance with core strategy policy CP12. The proposal would not lead to an over-concentration of non-retail uses and in that respect would comply with policy CP15. The Micropore would represent an acceptable community facility and in that respect would comply with policy CP21. Overall, it's considered that the proposal would be in line with planning policy. The main other consideration uh, is the impact on amenities. Concerns have been raised regarding potential nuisance and antisocial behaviour um, by Councillor Hassel. However, the type of establishment being proposed, coupled with the recently issued premises licence and no objections from, from the police, result in there being insufficient amenity grounds to refuse the application. Conditions controlling the use, the opening hours, external drinking and um, amplified and live music are recommended and the recommendation is to grant permission. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's been a long wait. The, <laughs> there were a number of objections made by local residents, members of the public, to the license application for these premises. Most of those objections were deemed to be planning objections and not relevant to the licensing process. There is a feeling that these objections should have been passed to planning, hence the lack of objections from local residents. The music side of this license is a concern because they're talking about live music. Live music attracts more than the usual number of customers, but I note that there is no indication of the number of patrons that are likely to be allowed in this establishment. There are only four parking spaces. One that I would uh, presume would be for the flat above and there are three staff going to be employed and so there are no off-street parking facilities. So that would mean that on-street parking will be increased and I'm surprised that highways have not commented because there is currently a local highway priority to decrease on-street parking in this area to improve traffic flow, particularly buses. Buses and fire appliances have been stopped because of parking issues in this area. If the local priority is uh, put forward, then there will be less on-street parking. This will make uh, this area a particularly difficult one. When you take into consideration the school and the church, both these sites would be adversely impacted. As members will know, I am not against licensed premises, uh, but uh, I do feel that on this occasion, the impact on the local community, i.e. the amenity of local residents in this area and the extracurricular activities that will be associated with an establishment of this kind still need addressing further. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I would have thought the number of patrons is dictated by the size of the place, and it's extremely small, but that's just me. Okay, uh, Councillor Hassel, you asked for this one to be brought to uh, the committee, so I'll give you first dibs. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll be brief because uh, Councillor Webb has stolen all of my thunder on this uh, matter. However, I thought it mindful to bring it to committee because there were, as was alluded, a number of objections at the licensing stage, and I can tell you that was upwards of 40 objections. Now, these were related to antisocial behaviour, noise, crime, and such like, and parking. For, for whatever reason, and I'm no licensing expert, these were dismissed as not material considerations, uh, rightly or wrongly. But I think 
with the current lack of um, objections at this stage, there is clearly some confusion amongst residents where those objections should have gone. Um, again, and with any planning application, it's not what it is, it's where. I've, I, I've got no personal objection to micropubs. I think they're a fantastic enterprise. Um, there is one not too far away at Park Farm, um, but a slightly different setting. It has a great deal of parking nearby, and it's not adjacent to residential properties like this is. On that view that's in front of us there, as you can see, it backs right onto residence gardens. Those two particular residents are quite elderly. Um, and obviously, they themselves have concerns over this uh, application. The, the, as you can see from the report, um, it can open from 10 in the morning to 11 at night, which for all intents and purposes is all day, <coughs> every day. Um, Micropubs by their nature are quiet places without music, as far as I know, the ones that I've frequented. Uh, this one is not that. It it's highlights it's to have pipe music and live music, which is really my main concern, and live music up to 11 o'clock at night. This precinct is in a, re in a residential area, as you can see, and I don't think... Um, a building or a use of this nature is appropriate in this setting. I think it's, it's inadequate parking-wise. Uh, as Councillor Webb has already alluded to, there is uh, plans afoot to reduce the parking. I think the parking uh, provision there at the moment is minimal anyway. Prior to that, as use as a beauty salon, obviously these appoint the people would visit there by appointment pubs is entirely different. Um, that, that is an issue. But I think overall, there needs to be great consideration for those living nearby to this place. Um, and I don't think that was taken to, into full account at the licensing stage. Uh, and obviously, as you'll not be surprised, I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think a, a point, a technical point has arisen that procedural point about licensing and planning. Um, if people send in, an, in uh, an objection to the council, they're not sure the subtleties between the two. And I think we ought to ask our officers uh, at some point um, to, to have a protocol with, with licensing so that these things where they, they overlap can be handed over um, in one way or the other. I think that's, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. Um, as a, about your point about that nobody else has live music, you've obviously not been to the last post in, in uh, Utoxted Road. They have such loud, such live music, you can hardly get in the place, but that does limit the number of people being there. There is no parking in uh, Utoxted New Road. There's no parking at Chester Green to speak of because all the residents have already parked there. Um, it, I've done a study of micropubs <laughs> purely in, in, in the... In, in the interests of um, uh, background research for, the, for this uh, 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 debate, obviously. Um, Councillor Potter. Thank you, Chair, and I welcome your comment about uh, licensing and planning joining up so that uh, objections are not lost. Um, like my colleagues have said, being an Alistair Councillor, we have had a number of comments about this. Um, the applicant says, quiet, relaxed atmosphere, and then elsewhere it's amplified and live music. It's either one or the other for me. I am not against these sort of uh, premises. We have one in Alastria already, the pothole at Park Farm, but it has on-site security, a large car park, and CCTV coverage. And it can also deal with smokers who have to leave the premises and smoke outside. My fear is, will they be able to control smokers if they go outside, taking their alcohol, alcohol with them and drinking outside? Um, there will be residents who will be watching this like a hawk, um, and perhaps I might have to go in undercover just to make sure things are okay. Um, yeah. 
A technical question. If there is a breach of the licensing laws, does it affect the planning application? Okay. Right, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, this is a, a, a good application. Um, there are um, existing um, premises, as you've alluded to, um, very similar at Chester Green and at uh, Utox to Old Road um, that um, are very successful and um, uh, seem to operate with, uh, without any, any issues. Um, what issues there are can be dealt with, I think, through... Um, licensing regulations um, so I see no reason at all not to approve this one chair. Councillor Howard. Thank you chair. Um, yeah it's uh, like turning the clock back a bit with micro pubs isn't it? How nice it's to go in there and have a game of dominoes and what have you instead of going in these pubs with live music all over the place and popping ears out etc. Um, quite honestly I mean I am perturbed with the music aspect. Uh, Chester Green, they don't have that as far as I'm aware. Certainly when I popped in there, they didn't. It was a very friendly atmosphere. And I even won at Domino's, that was good. So I, I say this, no problem with the place at all, but I am perturbed about the music, that's all. And I think uh, if, if we get to a situation where the music is not there, uh, as regards live music, then I think no problem at all. Um, as far as I'm concerned, pre-recorded music is the work of the devil, um, uh, and, uh, and I'm against it. Hence, condition number six, restricting noise emissions from any live or amplified music to prevent this taking place in any external areas of the premises, etc. So it is covered by uh, a condition that you've put there. The most successful pub chain in the country is Weatherspoons. They don't play music in Weatherspoons, and people love it. And it's time other breweries and publicans and licensees realise that. But that's, that's my particular rant. What I do find in the, in the micro pubs is they all have super fast broadband and people come in and, and use that on their laptops with a drink, not necessarily alcoholic, uh, during the daytime. And they, it, it's a good hub to, to do that sort of thing in. Uh, and, that works elsewhere. I don't see why it shouldn't in Alistair Street, particularly. Councillor Kerr. Uh, I don't frequent pubs with noise either. I like quiet. Um, but this particular one, um, there have been quite a lot of comments about the lack of, of parking. And I know people always say this before, but last time I was in that neighbourhood centre, I don't think there was any convenient cycle parking. And I just wondered if we could condition some cycle parking to go with the pub, because of course people shouldn't really be driving um, be cycling, as well yeah, as going to the pub. No, no, <laughs> different rules, different rules. I can't get points on a cycling license because there isn't a license to go with a cycling. Um, but it just might be a thought. I think as a cycling champion, you're doing your job wonderfully, Lucy, uh, and, and have to be commended. Um, is, is, can we... Do we do anything about cycling um, advisory note or something? Yeah, I think we'll, in this case, I think we may stretch it for councillor care. Yeah. Every time I've got up there, all right, I'm not an Alistair resident, but there, there is... Um, oh, Mr. Clark wants to say something. Okay. Briefly, briefly Chair, um, the red edge of the application site excludes any opportunity for cycle parking. It's tightly drawn around the building. It's a change of use, so the forecourt isn't available for the your cycle parking. Thank you, Chair. Right, fair enough. Uh, but if you look just up the road there, there is off-road parking, uh, which during the day gets busy. Those shops aren't open in the evening. All right, this, the, the, the hours of this pub will be 10 till 11 so uh, yes there will be people using it during the day but you, you can park up there in the evening certainly that's where I would park off the road um, and it, it's, it's quite safe to do so the beauty of cycles is you can go anywhere uh, and park them anywhere safely provided uh, you lock them up enough um, Anybody else wish to speak on this application? 
Okay, the um, recommendation is to grant planning permission with conditions, uh, and there's six of them there with the reasons. Those in favour of the um, recommendation? Nine. There's one abstention. Fair enough. Mine's a pint. Um, looking at the list at item nine. Laura. Okay, yeah. Um, Laura is our major um, uh, application officer, uh, does an excellent job on that. Um, one I want to mention, as I said last time, uh, the landmark uh, application in, in Phoenix Street, um, that's going to be controversial by any estimation. Uh, and we did try to set up uh, a site visit with uh, a fly-through demonstration beforehand. But I think, Laurie, you've not had too many favourable um, responses for that date. It's not likely to come to this committee before November at the earliest. Uh, so I think, um, do members feel that a, a new appointment might make sense? And Councillor West has particularly made the point that uh, um, site visits should be early or late in the day. We used to have them at lunchtime because... In the winter, that's the, the best time to see anything, and, and people sort of get their lunchtime off or something like that. But uh, that, that's open to your debate, wh wh whatever you want to do. Councillor Kerr. Practical point, because when I opened the email, I read the email, and then I said, I think I said maybe. Um, and, then, and then the whole thing disappeared, and I couldn't <coughs> access what, what time it was that I was supposed to be putting into my diary. No, but yes, but then I, but I don't use that regularly. I use a paper diary, for example. If you do what I do, which is terribly unecological, I print it out before I answer, uh, and, and then I've got I a piece of paper to remind well. me. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that does happen. So could, could, we, could, we, could you sort of somehow use the technology in a slightly different manner, please? Send an email as well, if that's that easier. Do. Do. Okay. So, what I'm suggesting is that the date that was fixed, I can't remember what it was, uh, 21st we cancel and, and that we, we try and get a bit more of a consensus because I think it's extremely important mm -hmm. that we not only look at the site but look at the um, presentation beforehand. Councillor Potter. Yes, Chair, I'll support that. Thank you. Um, Chair, just another point. We, we made lunchtime uh, site visit to accommodate certain people who said they could get out of their business at lunchtime and come and view, and that's one of the reasons why it was... Well, I, I'm going to hand it back to Laura and say cancel the one we've got and canvas opinion for times and dates and we'll try and find something that pleases absolutely everybody, which is uh, a very tough <laughs> ask, but if you can handle Rafina Farm, you can handle that. Okay, getting down to the appendix then, um, Thirsk Place, Derby, that's off Ascot Drive, isn't it? Um, erection of 15 industrial units. Do you want to go there? The Don't think anybody would need to. Uh, okay. Uh, St. Helen's House, now this is a variation of condition, uh, but a visit wouldn't make an awful lot of difference. What they are proposing to do... Um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's the enabling de uh, development which is going up now. Um, there were conditions about having it with proper uh, conservation windows and chimneys and so on. This application for a variation of condition is to have plastic windows and uh, do away with the chimneys, etc. So uh, it may concern a number of people, but I don't think a, a, a site visit is going to make an awful lot of difference to that. Uh, does anybody particularly want to go? Okay. Uh, the Royal Derby Hospital, I think we can see that on a plan better than we can all try to park there. Okay, enough said. Anybody want to go particularly? No, stay away from hospitals, they're filthy places. Yeah. Um, 
Railway Cottages, Sinfin Lane. Uh, this, this is a bit of a euphemism for the incinerator, isn't it? Um, again, I'm not sure what the variation condition is, but does anybody want to go and sniff it, or do we know it well enough? Um, it's just operational stuff. And it's just operational. All right, so I can't see we get anywhere. Former yarn spinner, public house, Stoney Lane, Spondon. Um, yeah, highly visible, but uh, closed as a pub. So anybody want to go there? No, fair enough. Um, Agard Street Car Park. Well, that is so screamingly obvious where it is. Uh, I can't see any point in, in visiting it just to see where yet another tower block might go. Um, anybody want to go there? Fair enough. Over the page, um, Andrew Close, Pritchett Drive and Allen Avenue, Little Over, erection, erection of 12 additional um, houses in association with previously approved outline application. Um, Chair, just to pick up on that one, um, we've now had, so I don't know if members can recall, um, the Allen Avenue scheme, um, it was granted outline planning permission, and that's the larger area that you can see on your screens, it's code um, 08 slash 18 slash 01313 that's now come in as a reserve matters application and we've subsequently had um, a full application for 12 units which is the smaller scheme um, the code 0718 so we thought we'd combine if a site visit if you wanted to see that one people want to go I think we did actually visit it some time ago but I'm not sure that too many members were involved you, you can get to it. It's, um, if you, need, you may need a map to do it. But Councillor Kerr. This, um, Chair, this is... Oh, thank you. The, the, nor, the top um, margins along the top of there is a brook, and the, yes. the land uh, near the, zig, the zigzag is a, um, a fairly steep bank up to the slip road from the A38 onto the A516. And the land sort of triangular piece of land there, or just beyond the triangle, it used to be the sewage works um, running along the brook. It's quite low-lying at the back, and it does the lower end of that, the red-marked area, does flood on occasion. And you've got the noise coming from the A38 and the slip roads, which are the main sort of characters of the area. The other thing that people would want you to see is that the whole of the housing that's, that it adjoins to is accessed from one single fairly narrow road onto the rest of the network. And the main concern in the area is, is traffic. So There are a number of concerns. Um, the, I suggest we go. The, the principle of the 80 houses has been agreed despite those concerns. Um, but, the, but seeing the layout with respect to the areas that potentially are flooding might be useful ah. for people. This application is for 12 additional to, in, to the ones we've already one. granted. And then it's the, the reserve matters of the layout for yeah. the, the rest of the site. Well, put it to the committee. Would you like to go? Please, please don't say on the day. I um, wish we went. I think let's put that down as a potential one. Um, but can we pick a, a dry day, please? And not when the sewage works is... Oh, the sewage flooding. works is all gone, don't worry. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Take your wellies and your dog. Former Rolls-Royce car park, Dunstall Park Road. Um, again, it's off Ascot Drive, but we can get to it, can't we? You can all go and have a look. Is that Osmiston Road? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Osmiston Road's to the west of it there. Yeah. But you'd, ad just, you'd get to it down Ascot Drive and then yeah, Dunstall. I'm just getting my, my bearings. Yeah. The, it's to erection of three buildings to form <coughs> six, 16 units. I don't think we're going to get any objections around there, are we? Nobody lives there. Well, Not unless they want to build them 15 storey high. No. Okay, fair enough. Nothing there then. And Wilkinson's Yard, um, that's another euphemism. Um, it's the Frygate Goods Yard. Uh, this is a proposal to put a uh, little... Um, oh, really? Uh, next to the listed building. Um, I think it might be quite useful for us to revisit that whole site uh, with an officer who can tell us what's what 
um, perhaps in, invite the conservation area advisory people in, in, in view of the fact that it's uh, a listed building. Uh, with the, the proposal is not at, uh, to use the listed building, it is to uh, put it just north of it there. I think uh, was... And the quality of a building next to a, a listed building is important. Little are proposing something like little do. Like little do. Yeah, it's, it's a school that they're going to have there, far away from that. That's well away from it. It's, wow. it's down where the uh, Great Northern Road, okay. where the old Fantastic. electricity offices used to be. I think this is the area where there's really good butterflies or something. Yeah, butterflies are a good objection to any development in the last 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can I suggest we do make a point of going there? Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Again, Laura will do her best to make everybody... Uh, mutually convenient. Which brings us to, not to the end, but to a talk on um, the new MPPF. I'm sure you're waiting with bated breath, uh, and I know um, Stephen will be as brief as he possibly can. And, and if ever, any officers have already heard all this, um, you, you, you won't, you're not expected to stop if you'd rather move. Okay.